You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. And welcome, Hoosier fans, to this week's edition of Assembly Call Radio, where each week we discuss the most important topics in the world of Indiana basketball. This is our 331st edition of Assembly Call Radio and our 1,030th episode overall of the Assembly Call, recorded on the evening of April 18th, 2024. I am your host, Jared Morris. And let's begin this edition of the Assembly Call how we begin every edition of the Assembly Call, and that is with our Hoosier Proud Banner Moment. Well, I've got two banner moments for you this week, one on the women's side, one on the men's side, and they're both related because as we have come to learn over the years, if you're going to win basketball games at the level of going to championships and winning championships, you've got to get talent and that talent needs to develop into NBA talent. And so our first banner moment goes to Mackenzie Holmes, drafted by the Seattle franchise in the WNBA, which marks the third straight year that a member of Terry Moran's team has been drafted uh, in the WNBA. Ali Patberg was drafted uh, two years ago. Grace Berger, obviously, last year by the Indiana Fever. uh, And then Mackenzie Holmes this year could not be happier for Mackenzie. Obviously, she's going to be, you know, dealing with her knee issue and I think, you know, may even be out for the season. Uh, But to get drafted and to be a developmental prospect for them uh, is huge. It's a great testament to her. And it's obviously a great testament to the program that Terry Morin is building that she continues to put players into the WNBA. So that is a great sign. And on the men's side, you know, look, I'm not going to belabor this too much because we're going to talk about it a lot tonight. And there are still a lot of questions about how all these pieces are going to fit together. But when you enter an offseason needing to replace seven guys, and the first three guys that you get are a five-star McDonald's All-American, ranked 20th in the country by 24-7 sports. You get one of the best lead guards in the country uh, who also happened, but one of the best young lead guards in the country who also happens to have three years of eligibility left was the Pac-12 freshman of the year in Miles Rice. And then to top that off, you get the number one portal prospect overall by 24-7 that fills a gaping hole left by Khalil Ware and Umar Balo. That is just, there's no way to put it. That's a, no other way to put it. That's a great way to start the offseason for Indiana. So again, you look at banners, you got to have talent. A lot of times you got to have pro talent. And that's certainly happening on the women's side. And we hope that with some of these additions on the men's side, uh, that it's happening for Mike Woodson and co as well. All right, now let me introduce my co-host this week. Uh, Coach is off, enjoying being a grandpa. I was texting with him uh, about that last night. He is over the moon, uh, he and Amy, as you can imagine. Uh, so he's not here with us tonight, but here with me, ladies and gentlemen, the Kurt Signetti of Girls Youth Sports Coaching in Cincinnati, the president emeritus of the Robert Johnson Fan Club, and one of my two favorite bracketologists, it is Andy Bottoms. The best of you sports coaching, you know that we got them. When it comes to analytic trends, you know he can spot them. For first class bracketology, if you want the top, you gotta go bottom. Bottoms. If you want the top, you gotta go bottom. Bottoms. If you want the top, you You've done this so long, Andy, I don't even need that on the run sheet to just be able to rattle off the top don't, of my don't head. Need it. <laughs> You were going to host, so that's not on the run sheet, but you know, it just, just flows. I guess when you've done it for 12 years, 13 years, that's what happens. Uh, yeah. What is your bottoms line on this week in Indiana basketball? Well, like you said, uh, you know, this time of year is, is all you can do is, is try to get excited about the prospects that you have. And I think we're probably uh, riding the line of uh, having gotten maybe too excited in years past, but it, it's hard not to be uh, with one of the better point guards uh, in the class, a guy that's got some eligibility left. Uh, and and the best player, according to some portal rankings, to to come in and uh, really give you rebounding, rim protection, uh, all those things. And then Bryson Tucker, the, the official announcement uh, was today, and with some comments from the the staff and uh, from the university. Obviously, we knew about that before, and so I think he's got some tools that make him uh, really interesting as well to to look at and figure out how he'd fit in. So you're starting to get at least 
you, the the nucleus of the team at this point. Few other pieces to add. We'll we'll talk about that, but uh, I think things have gone about as well as you could hope at this point. We we talked about uh, on some of these shows uh, late in the season that it was going to be imperative that they really hit a home run in the in the portal, and uh, to this point, our early returns are are very good. So uh, I think you can't be anything but excited about that. To your point, probably still a little bit earlier to figure out how the you know some of the complementary pieces come together. Uh, what other, you know, can you get, you know, another big name in the mix and uh, and kind of figure things out there. But at least you're starting to get a, a bit of an idea of what the um, the core rotation guys will be. And, uh, you know, that that's exciting. I still had a movement in the Big Ten uh, to talk through as well and trying to figure out how you fit in uh, will be, you know, harder this year than most. And uh, as you look at just all the change uh, across the league and starting to see a few dominoes fall across the country with some guys. I think it's seems like commitments have picked up a little bit this week as you go through that. But um, you've also had more guys put their name in uh, over the course of the week as well. So uh, the ever uh, the ever changing carousel of players uh, is uh, is still in full motion at this point. Uh, Ryan is not here yet. He is supposed to be here. He's helping his parents with something, uh, and so he should be here anytime. Uh, I just want to give a quick shout out to Viper in the chat, who, when we were a few minutes late without being prompted, said we blame Ryan. And I just want you to know that we appreciate that, and you're 100 percent correct. So thank you, Viper. Uh, that is uh, that was really nice of you to say. Um, all right. So on tap this week, we're going to talk about transfer portal madness because it is ridiculous. Uh, I mean, it's kind of fun and. <laughs> It's totally ridiculous and it's kind of annoying and it like there's just there's a whole range of emotions and thoughts that, that kind of go through this. And so we'll talk through some of that uh, and just all the upheaval in the Big Ten. In segment two, we're going to dive into our thoughts on Umar Balo uh, and Miles Rice. Obviously, Andy and Ryan weren't able to be on the emergency pod, so I'm very curious to hear what they have to say. Uh, and I've got a couple numbers on Synergy that I think are really interesting about just kind of the different ways that Arizona ran their offense with Umar Balo and some of the different ways we've run it and what, you know, that may suggest to us uh, about how this is going to go next season. And then we got some great questions uh, for the mailbag. And so we'll do that in segment three, all of that coming this week on assembly call radio. But first let's talk about our presenting sponsor. This edition of Assembly Call Radio, like all shows on the Back Home Network, presented by our friends at Home Field Apparel, where they have the largest collection of vintage IU apparel that you'll find anywhere. As you know, it's not just IU. Home Field has unique, interesting designs printed on the softest and most comfortable fabrics for over 150 colleges and universities, and they're expanding way beyond that. You know, they already got into the NFL with the Colts. Uh, I think they're going to have some Indiana Fever stuff coming. But what they have coming tomorrow, Andy, have you seen the previews of the Little Five stuff that's coming? I, I've seen what they put on social media. I haven't seen any more than that. And even that stuff is, uh, looks fantastic. Dude, the ja that black jacket with the Little Five logo on the back looks so sharp. So if you want that, I don't know what the supplies look like. And they've obviously gotten better at you know being able to gauge how much they need to have on, on hand. That seems like the kind of thing that's going to go quickly. Um, so I will definitely be ready to order that uh, as soon as it goes live. But they've got some great T-shirts. Uh, Connor was showing us in Discord some of the T-shirts they have. If you want to wear something for Little Five, and obviously Little Five is this week, check this stuff out. It is awesome. So follow them on Twitter. Get on the email list. Get the text alerts. Because, again, sometimes you really want to be there when stuff comes out. So you don't have to wait for them to restock it. Uh, this stuff looks really, really cool. And obviously, it's one of the great traditions of IU. And as I've learned, it's a great conversation starter, especially when you're not in Indiana. You know, when people ask about Little 500, and it's great to be able to tell them about it. Uh, so anyway, we love Home Field Apparel. Go check them out, homefieldapparel.com. The promo code is HOME23, which will get you 15% off your first order. That is promo code HOME23. Again, the website, homefieldapparel.com. Wear one for the team. Uh, all right, who's your headlines? The IU football spring game just happened. Uh, did you get a chance, Andy, to watch any of it on BTN? I got to watch about 10 minutes. Um, I was doing yard work for the vast majority of the evening as the uh, rainfall here has made the yard a bit of a, a, a challenge. So uh, I got to see a little <laughs> bit of it. Uh, thought Curtis Rourke looked good in the part that I saw uh, him, him leading the offense. So excited about that. But, yeah, I did not get to see a uh, – a, 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 a large sample of the game at this point. 
Yeah, so I will. I didn't get to watch much of it either because I was doing bedtimes. But my dad was texting me about it, and uh, you know, obviously, I respect his opinion on football. So I'll just tell you what he said. Uh, he said that was an impressive drive. Offense makes sense. Uh, and then I asked him how Rourke looked. He said Rourke was okay. Got better as scrimmage went on. Uh, the backup. He didn't know Taven's name, but he said the backup uh, looked really good in that first series. Then threw an, an INT. Team looked sound. Not a lot of penalties or turnovers. Defense tackled well. Uh, so he was, uh, he was overall like my dad's not like effusive in his praise and like the way he describes things that's effusive praise for my dad when it comes to football. So a good, a good debut. It sounds a good public debut. It sounds like for Kurt Signetti, uh, and the Hoosiers, which was nice to see. I mean, hearing they tackled well is music to anyone's ears at this point. So I think, <laughs> I mean, no, if there's you know, one that's thing I, I took was... away from that, that would be what it is. I, I was going back and forth with Taylor Lehman about this, who writes bite-sized bison, you know, about what did you want to see? Like, to me, I just wanted to see a college football team that looked professional, you know, in a sense where just the details are buttoned up. There's, you know, there's, you're not waiting for personnel groupings to get on and all this disorganization. That's kind of what you would expect from a Kurt Signetti team. And it sounds like that's what Indiana looked like. So that is all well and good. Well, hey, look, we have someone else new who just popped in here. Nice to see you, uh, Mr. Phillips, here to join us. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's get your, let's get your thoughts, your opening thoughts on just this week in Indiana basketball, anything else that's on your mind? Hi everybody. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm helping my parents out at their house right now. They're getting, they had some roof issues and some leaks and they're getting it all painted and they just left town. So that means that I have to sit there from 8 AM until 6 ish PM waiting for everybody to finish. Not a problem. They, my mom birthed me. I still owe her for that, so that's fine. But that's why I'm late, so I apologize. Um, that woman's a saint. She, she really absolutely is. is. They've dealt with me for much longer than you guys. Trust me, had birthing to. you was the easy part. Yeah, that seriously. <laughs> that was. I mean, that was a, that was a breeze compared to the rest of that. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I yeah, look. Getting Omar Ballo is a massive pickup for Indiana. I, say what we might about the too big set up but that's what indiana is going to go with and i think that's probably just something they have to expect into the future and after khalil Ware took off you had to get somebody who fit that role and there is nobody better in the transfer portal to fit that role than ballo and i think that he's a guy and you guys talked about in the emergency podcast he's more athletic than he looks uh because yes. he's, he's a big guy and he's built like a man and and where as Ware was really skinny but skilled ballo has some skill but he's also a monster. I mean, he is. And, and I remember when Indiana played uh, Arizona in 2022, I just remember thinking, man, I wish Trace would play more like him. And, and I didn't mean it as a knock on Trace. Trace physically couldn't do that because he's not seven feet to whatever, you know, 65 or whatever. But I remember yeah. just thinking like that, that aggressive power game is something that Indiana was missing. And for the most part was missing last year as well as, as Cleo was more skilled and he would go through people at times. And for the most part, he was using his skill to go over people and around people. Ballo is just going to go through you. And, and I think that there is skill, but he also can just bully people. And, and I think that will be really fun for Indiana to watch, uh, Indiana fans to watch. It's a fit. There's still holes on the roster. They need to attack aggressively over the next couple of days and weeks. Uh, but I think that you've gotten the two big things that everybody knew they needed. They needed a point guard. They needed a rim protector. You've got that done with, Filled it with good players too, who have done stuff. These aren't guys coming from a lower level, you know, or or guys who sat on the bench last year and are coming in for more playing time. Like these are established good college basketball players with a ceiling to be great. And Ballo at times has been great. Uh, and 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 Rice certainly was great at times this year and could definitely take that next step. So you just have to fill out the other spots. Uh, the, the, the bench needs a lot right now because you're pretty much bringing back a lot of the guys you had last year. I think that they're going to get a shooting guard and Trey Galloway, I would assume, is going to be the sixth man, which I think we talked about, I think is his best role. And then I think you need to get one more shooter. And I think you definitely need to get a backup rim protector. And then maybe a taller athletic wing is, is probably what you need. Maybe, maybe an upside play or a veteran who's coming in to play you know, from a smaller school, trying to play at a bigger school. I, I don't know. But somebody who can go off the wing and do some things, if, if Mbako's in foul trouble, you don't lose much size and, and, and athleticism there. So really good week. Uh, got some really good players added to this team. 
It's just a matter of, you know, and, and I, I tweeted this out the other day. I was like, Ballo's a great get. And then the next thing I said was, now Indiana needs to find shooters. And people are like, can't you just be happy? And I was like, no, no, no. I am happy, but they just need, this is the next thing they need to do. And I think that we all agree. It's it's shooting and probably back up, you know, some, some size and athleticism uh, for the bench. Do we have official word on the proper pronunciation? Is it Ballo or Ballo? I, I thought it was Ballo. Is it, is it Ballo? Okay, I think we got to figure Umar. this out. Because I've I'm not, gone and like researched it, and I hear people say his name differently everywhere. So I watched some Arizona games this year. I really like the way Tommy Lloyd coaches. I like the way Arizona plays. I think they're a lot of fun. And from what I saw, and it might not be correct, but it was he was regularly called Umar Ballo. Now, I don't Umar know Ballo. if that, okay. again, I don't know if that's right. So we can get a pronunciation. I think we should contact Indiana and get a pronunciation guy. Well, yeah, that's what we did with Ware last year because yeah. they put it out. I just haven't seen it yet. Okay, so yeah. let's henceforth for this episode, we'll go with Umar Ballo. I'm cool with that. Umar Ballo, and then we'll try to get the big official guy. work. The big guy. We'll just call eventually, big I'm, sh- big I'm sure guy. he'll do an interview with the hysterics or somebody, yeah. and then you know he'll say what it is. So and and we'll I will out. say too, he's, just call him he, Big Fella in yeah, just uh, big, Mike Woodson sure. parlance. Yeah, <laughs> someone. Just, so, by the way, Miles Rice. Yeah, to to to. To to Woodson Miles Rice is big fella. Like they're all they're all. I think that's just you know everybody gets that. No, that's my nickname. No, no, no. he called. We, me we that. were talking in the Discord about how much fun Scott on Crimson Cast is going to have with Ballo, and I think it was Jay that was like, he's just going to have to go with Big Fella. Like, yeah, the big <laughs> he's guy. Just have to, and that's you know that's probably fine. That's the Arizona that kid. Fine. The Arizona kid. <laughs> the Arizona kid. Um, last Scott's thing before we talk about can, the Big Ten, you can like- get Boogie Flanders now that he's back on the back <laughs> yeah. on the market. By the way, the uh, the Arizona kid sounds like a gunslinger from the late 1800s, so I kind of like it. I don't know. Yeah, it does. The Arizona kid. Um, Trace Jackson Davis ended what was by all accounts an outstanding rookie season. Uh, their season ended last night with a loss to Sacramento. Uh, our friend Damon Bruce is going to have a whole offseason of talking about what the Warriors' future is. Um, but any quick thoughts, Ryan, on, on Trace Jackson Davis, who said he was going to make people regret passing on him? And did. You know, I think it was, I saw Kevin O'Connor did his all-NBA rookie team and Trace was second team, uh, which has kind of been the consensus. Basically, he was one of the top 10 rookies in the league. Um, Just uber productive and at every turn really has credited the coaching that he got at Indiana as part of what helped him develop and just his experience at Indiana, which has been a great recruiting tool for the Hoosiers, you know, to go out and use. And obviously, Trace's example is a big part of the reason why you get Khalil Ware and why you get, uh, you know, Umar Ballo. Yeah, I um, I think it was a fantastic year. I don't think a lot of people expected it, but I don't think Indiana fans are surprised. Uh, I, I think that he no. was a guy, when when he went to the Warriors, that fit is impeccable. It just is yes. because they're an up-tempo, rim-running team that he is going to get plenty of opportunities. I think he surprised people defensively because of his size. And honestly, you have to credit Mike Woodson for making him a better defender. I remember when he made the the all-defensive team. I don't remember who was his junior year. I think it was his junior year. He made the all-defensive team. I had several Big Ten people text me. They're like, I saw that and laughed. He blocked shots. He was not a good defender. And and his senior year, he was a very good defender. And, And just the way he moved and his athleticism, using it, to his peak ability, not chasing block shots, but letting them come to him. Uh, and, and then that you saw that this year. Uh, I think he's gotten a little more athletic in the NBA. You see some of his getting up over people more than he did in college. Happens to guys once they're able to play basketball full time, they get better. And, and I just think that he was a guy who surprised a lot of people. But again, I don't think anybody in Indiana who, who watched him, you might be surprised just how good he got. But I don't think anybody's surprised that he that he acclimated to the NBA pretty quickly. So, not after gr- his senior season, for sure. No, no. I mean, if people forget just how dominant he was as a senior. He got overshadowed by Zach Eady because of Eady's numbers being seven foot four. But Trace went toe to toe with him largely in two games against Purdue. You know, it just it didn't result in. I mean, you know, Eady outstripped him on the numbers, but Trace played better team basketball than Eady did, and his team won both games. And yep. and. I'll also say that I would expect Trace to be on the list for the FIBA World Cup USA team because of the way he plays with the international. So 2026, I would expect him to be on the list, maybe not get in, but the way he plays fits that style of basketball so well and the top guys don't play. So I would not be surprised if he's involved in that. It's you know whether or not he makes the team or not, I think he'll be on the list. And he's such a great complimentary piece. You know, and he's he, a he great can, guy to play with stars. And he can sit you know? in that role and be fine. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, and I would say, you know, it, you know, last last thing on this, Andy, you know, to Ryan's point, I, it, it's always been ludicrous. People who try to take away credit from Mike Woodson for helping Trace develop, it's insane. Like you just, you weren't paying attention to Trace's first two years and his second two. And yes, there was going to be some natural growth. But I think, you know, to your point about how his first year he just blocked a lot of shots, it felt to me, you know, Woodson's first year, he unleashed Trace. And then his last year, he helped refine him you know, defensively, understanding assignments better, the passing, all the little things. That's what got better. That and just the, you know, bringing that consistent effort to dominate every game. Um, and you absolutely have to give Mike Woodson and the staff a lot of credit for that, and Trace does. Um, it, you know, and so it's just, it's, it, it's just one of those things, like, nothing unites Indiana fans right now in kind of this weird time when it feels like there's, like, factions or whatever. Nothing unites Indiana fans like a great Trace game in the NBA. You know, because everybody just loves him and, and appreciates so much about what he brought uh, to Indiana. Andy, any any final thoughts on Trace's rookie season? The only thing that I'd add is just it was interesting as the season wore on. I think it was, I don't know, a week or two weeks ago. Steve Kerr was kind of like, I wish I'd played him more earlier. Um, and I think they kind of had a plan for him to bring him along slowly. I think they saw uh, what he could be. But then at a certain point, it was... Um, he was one of their better options uh, to play that position. They had different things with, you know, Draymond come up and they had some, some, some different things with Draymond come up. I, I mean, what are you going nice to I mean, what are you gonna say? Like, you were the kindest. Well, there were, the there are different things. I mean, yeah, there were, like they were different. One. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> different versions of the same thing are still different. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I, I think there were some, some of those things opened up opportunities for him to play. And then once he, once he played, he, he was ready and stepped in and played well and, and earned himself more playing time. And I think that's, you know, high praise from a, a really good coach to be back, to be able to say he was great. And I, I could have done more with him or we could have done more with him and we played him earlier. So I think that bodes well for his future that has established himself as part of their rotation. And then just kind of figure out what his role can grow into from there and uh, how big of a piece of their team he's really going to be, but uh, you know, a, a really successful first year and um, made good on his, his words from draft night, as you, as you said, to start things out. All right, so before we dive in and talk about Indiana and how the roster is filling up, I want to just kind of step out and take a little bit of a macro look at the Big Ten here because uh, there was a stat, and I, I want to credit, I think it was Mike from um, the Daily Hoosier who tweeted this out. And I'll preface this by saying, you know, you think back to the end of February and March, there was some very realistic fear that there were going to be even more players leave Indiana than ended up leaving and that we would have even more spots to fill. And, you know, look, a combination of having, you know, really attractive NIL resources, obviously guys who came to Indiana and really liked Bloomington, uh, you know, a team that seemed to find some chemistry toward the end of the season, and obviously being sold on a vision for the future by the staff, all of that stuff resulted in Malik Renew returning and Mackenzie Mbako returning. And that is great. I mean, it was obviously a huge way to begin the offseason. Yeah, I mean, I think it was all part of it. You know, it was a huge way to begin the offseason. Um, and, and, you know, and so now you look at it, I think this will surprise some people. These are the amount of transfers that each Big Ten team has lost going out. There are three teams that lost six guys, Rutgers, Nebraska, and USC. Yes, we have to start including all of these teams as Big Ten teams. It's so weird. Silly. Um, there but were five USC teams. The coaching change, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are different reasons for it. But, you know, five teams lost five guys. Two teams lost four guys. And then Indiana is in the group of teams that lost three. Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, UCLA, and then Oregon, Purdue, Michigan State, Northwestern lost two or one. And, you know, I just I think that is interesting, you know, given kind of what this felt like at the end of the season. You know, there there is more stability in Bloomington than there is in in, you know, a lot of the other teams in the Big Ten, which is going to be helpful now when you're adding the talent on top of it. Um, worth, you know, so Andy, as you kind of, t or do you have a point on that, Ryan? Yeah, just worth noting, I Indiana also lost three guys, not from the transfer portal, but those were expected. So you're kind of planning yes. for those long term. So just to note, like they did yes. lose six guys, but three of them you were prescribed, you were going to lose for a while. And then you got a surprise addition of two seniors coming back as well. So where you're looking, you were going to miss five just from that pot. Well, that wasn't a surprise. Okay. Galloway and Leo weren't surprises. Well, it, a couple weeks before they announced it, it was. I mean, there were there were definitely there were definitely rumors out there that Leo was. Well, we disagreed go. on those. I was never worried about Galloway, but 
Anyway, but it's, Leo, that's... Leo was go. I mean, I think most people thought Leo was just going to go into private, just go into business. Like, I mean, I from what I was told, and and Galloway, I know you didn't believe it, but there were there were some people in good positions who thought he was potentially going to go. But I I agree, it happened the way it's supposed to. But again, so yeah, they had to replace six guys, but three of them you were planning for for months. So it's yeah, different well, and... in the transfer portal. And that's the thing, Andy, is, you know, the three transfers that Indiana did lose, and they're all three guys that we liked, Peyton Sparks, CJ Gunn, and Caleb Banks. You know, we were all disappointed that CJ and Caleb didn't take bigger steps forward. But none of those three guys were guys that you would have been penciling into starting positions for this season based on what you had seen. You know, and now you're seeing, I mean, Wisconsin lost A.J. Store, Chucky Hepburn just went into the transfer portal, A.J. Hogard at Michigan State, which... Tom Izzo may not be too mad about because they've always had kind of a weird energy, but still that's a productive four year starter. And so, you know, again, it is important sometimes I think to take a step out because we have talked a lot about, man, they've got this difficult needle to thread and they've got to fill all these pieces, but man, I mean, everybody not, and not just across the big 10. I mean, it feels like so many teams are dealing with upheaval and comparatively, it feels like Indiana's has actually been a little bit more stable than, you know, than a lot of other teams that have been out there, which is, you know, again, I mean, it, it, you know, it, you think back to where we were and to where we are now, and there were very legitimate concerns then. And that is why I think now there are some legitimate reasons to say, okay, you know, this thing is going in a better direction than we thought. Um, and that's a thing to be really optimistic about. Yeah, I, I agree. I think you're getting into, it's hard because you want to go back and look at historical data. And I know I brought this up, I think the last time that I was on and, and Mike from X's and Joe's and I have, you know, gone back and forth a little bit about some of this um, as well. Like you're trying to kind of find success stories of teams that have brought in a high number of guys in the portal. And there aren't a ton of those out there. It's not that there are none. Um, it, it presents chemistry issues. It presents, Lots of different things. Um, now, the challenge is, as that becomes more of the norm, we'll figure out whether is the general lack of historical precedent of it working out great because people hadn't figured out how to do it yet. I think that's entirely possible. Uh, yeah. And there will be programs, whether IU is one of them or not, remains to be seen, who find effective ways to do that. What we've seen so far is that it's been used to kind of earmark and, and pick a couple guys who can fill specific roles. And that has been really successful. Uh, you know, I, I think you can go through most of the teams in recent years who have done well, and you can find guys who they didn't overhaul the roster, but they were able to use the portal to find guys to fit very specific needs. And in some ways that's what IU has done this year. You just, the volume of guys you have to get in total to fill out the roster is more. Um, Margin for error gets smaller, the more you need. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. if if you view it through the lens of what IU really needed, they've checked off a couple huge boxes with the portal uh, at this point with with Rice and and Ballo. Apparently, uh, I did look up in the uh, in the Arizona media guide. Their pronunciation said it was Umar Ballo. So Ballo. So Ballo Umar or Ballo. Ballo. OK, so yeah. we are going to switch that's, the official pronunciation for this episode. It, that's what it looks Ballo. like. So, so ball. I, I, oh. Ballo the baller. Just there think of go. it that way. No. Ballo the baller. Oh, boy. Okay. Or you can just think of it as Ballo. Or, or don't. But neither <laughs> one. It, would be it helps. Hey, uh, look, my daughter and I, we were doing spelling words last night, and we came up with a great song, and she came home today, and she was like, hey, thanks for that song, because it helped me remember the words. Please don't we were sing working it. On like, well, we were working on like when you switch an I to a Y when words change. Maybe. AC After Dark. I'll sing yeah. you the song. Wow. I'll be I'll be uh, checking out before we get into that. That's called a tease. <laughs> Just uh, I don't even know what I was saying. I'm not, I'm not sure. Sorry, but I think, but yeah. So I think we're still trying to figure out like what does that really, what does that really look like for teams that are built heavily yeah. that way? And you're going to see a lot of it in the Big Ten this year. And for as much as everybody is very excited about the freshman that Rutgers is bringing in, uh, and rightfully so it's kind of walking in trying to figure out well, who's going to be there around them and, and how do you, it's that John Travolta in Pulp Fiction, Jeff, just like looking around, like <laughs> around. who else is here? Guys. Uh, yeah. So I think you're going to see, it? yeah, you're going to see a lot. And, and some of it's normal, you know, some of it's coaching stuff, right? Like, and, and so that's going to be expected, but some of it is also, uh, it, you know, just more, more than normal churn. Fred Hoiberg operates, uh, you know, certainly in the portal as much as anybody. So I guess losing yeah. guys to him is not really a huge deal, but um, 
yeah, definitely a lot of new faces in the Big Ten. I think with at least the guys that I use in on, good chance to get early scouting reports on the four Pac-12 teams that are joining um, between Ballo and uh, and Rice. They're in the potential for Carlisle. I mean, you've really already doing advanced scouting even at this point. So there's a reason they call uh, it the best coast. Yeah, right. Yeah. You go get the, <laughs> go get those guys. Well, I think Mike. It would have been funny if this were real recruiting. You'd be like, oh, so Mike Woodson just wants to head out west for a while and avoid the the cold. Um, yeah. Except they're more coming to visit you than you are. I know. To visit I know. If this were normal <laughs> recruiting, it'd be different. It's sort of like how he spent a lot of time in Florida this year. <laughs> Uh, any, any other thoughts, by the way, uh, kudos to Justin Beard, Balo can ball though. Yo, Balo can ball though. So that's just, okay. just another way to remember it. Just right. trying to help people out here with some phonetic. I was, uh, I was thinking about this as, as Andy was talking about this is, is Cam Spencer. And I don't mean like statistically or whatever. It, that has to be one of the best transfers ever. As far as fit, there's no, like he that impacted ha- two programs in a huge way. Yeah. I mean that like. I cannot because that's he's exactly you. UConn needed that kind of fu guy after they lost the guys they lost, and it's just I can't imagine a more perfect fit, especially playing for Hurley. It seemed like he was just an extension of Hurley on the floor. I just his personality and attitude. I I'm in awe of that man. Like that was such a perfect fit, and you win a national championship with him in one year. I thought that. I mean, Scott so he's going to get drafted now. I, I, if he doesn't, he'll be on the, uh, he'll be in the G League with it uh, on a two way contract for sure. Oh, well, I mean, yes. he only had the top offensive rating in the whole country. So I guess, oh, he did. Say, I didn't know that. I guess you could say it was a decent, it was a decent breaking rating. news. Yeah. yeah. I didn't, I didn't know that. That's, yeah, funny. he was number one. Yeah. 137.1. That's pretty good. That's decent. That's absurd. Good. Look, but, you got to get By the way, it. to Seth, to Seth, who was watching us on Facebook, he said, I need a link to Jared's hat. I just went to look for it. It's at from Home Field Apparel, of course. My favorite hat. It is sold out currently. Um, so it's the you know, Caitlin Clark check, jersey of hats. Check. Yes. Yes. So check back for that. <laughs> I'd go a long sure way for that. I'm sorry, time. guys. <laughs> yeah. It's been a long week. It took me a minute to process, but I got that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Fun conversation there. It's always nice, uh, you know, kind of taking a a macro look at the Big Ten. But now it is time to zero in on the Hoosiers. You two weren't able to be on the emergency pod talking about uh, Balo, talking about Miles Rice. And so we're going to break all of that down, how IU's roster is shaping up. Stick with us on the assembly call. All right. Hello, everybody. Nice to see so many people here on a Thursday night. We're just drafting off of the excitement of the spring game and Kurt Signetti. I'm pumped for football season, man. I'm so pumped for football season. Easily, the last time I was this excited was, of course, we all remember what season, and then it was a a dramatic letdown, like an immediate letdown. There has never been more excitement leading up to a season that crashed harder in the in the first quarter of that season the 2019 I, and, and it just I, never recovered yeah and on, I remember on some being level like, there's really nothing more iu football than that i have some really friends think who, about it yeah i have some friends who are season ticket holders and they're all just like we're gonna be so good and i was like i we, like because I, I remember just being like the COVID season was weird guys like you know and uh it, Okay, but we shouldn't have been. No, like, no, destitute. no. I I, mean, I agree, but it was like a lot of things that worked that year really course corrected the next, and it was like, like all the good then went horrible. It wasn't like it went to back to the median spot. I mean, if you go back and watch that season, Michael Penix and those receivers hit so many 50-50 balls that could have gone okay. either way. And so on that point, on that point, so Joel Klatt, who from I think is the best college football analyst out there. I think he's awesome. He does a weekly segment um, mm-hmm. here in Dallas. And so they were talking about the quarterbacks. And one of the things that he was saying about Penix, I thought was really interesting. He said the thing that separates Penix is, I mean, number one, just, you know, his ability to throw the ball deep, we all know. Mm-hmm. But what he talked about was a lot of quarterbacks when they throw the ball deep, they throw 50-50 balls. He said Penix, because of his ball placement and recognition, yes, I agree he throws 60-40 balls or 70-30 balls that for other quarterbacks are 50-50. And he said that is the skill that if he can stay healthy, 
could make him a star in the NFL. I'd never heard anybody put it that way, and it is the perfect way to describe what makes Penix so special. A guy who did that as well was Carson Palmer at USC. It's like he had these tall receivers, and he would put it just to the left of where it needed to be. I remember uh, an old story about Carson. I'm sure Michael could do this too, is they asked, he went for his workout with Cincinnati when he was going to be the number one pick, and they're like, all right, I want you to throw a 40-yard, like, you know, dart you know over here whatever and he's like all right do you want the ball pointing at the guy or do you want it out in front of him so he has to catch it like that and they were like what and he was just like which side of him do you want it on and they're like i i don't surprise us and he could do it both ways and it's just some guys are gifted with that incredible ball placement and Penix, the one thing that worries me about him and it's been the thing that's always worried me about him since he was a freshman is over the middle accuracy and if you can't throw over the middle in the NFL, you're going to get picked off a lot. I don't think he'll get picked off a lot, but it's a matter of having that feel for leading your guy perfectly over the middle while there's hands in your face and a linebacker. And he didn't do it in the national championship game. It was it was really ugly in the yeah. national championship. Now, part of that was because he was pressured like he hadn't been all year. Will he get used to that? But I think he has a chance to be a really good NFL quarterback. By the way, it was 2021, not 2019. The whole yes. that, that whole like three year span is a total blur. Just it was then. It was in so that more like time a five frame. year span. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's be real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. More more Penix talk coming up later. Um, but and let's some talk, talk basketball. And some talk yeah. about other media members. <clears throat> oh yeah, we're gonna talk about Greg Doyle. So just in case you want to know if we were gonna address that, we will talk about that. If you guys want to leave during that, you're more than welcome to Andy and Jared and I'll I'll uh well, no, I have thoughts. I'm going to go off thoughts. for a while on that. Total so. embarrassment to the city and state. Yeah. I no, only, only thing I'll say to the uh to get back to the the basketball piece and the transfers. At least right now, it, it's kind of hard cuz you have limited commitments, but of on the 247 where they do the team transfer rankings, there are a number of Big 10 teams that rank pretty highly there. IU is among them. Illinois is up there. They've gotten four guys already. Maryland's got a few. Ohio State got a couple. Uh Nebraska is like kind of close to 20th, but like I think Illinois, IU, Maryland and Ohio State are all top 10 in incoming classes as of right now, which Michigan is lurking, I would say. Do with that. (laughs) Yeah, do with that what you will. You know, a lot's going to change when guys actually start to commit. But there have been Big Ten teams who have made some waves with who they've picked up as well as who they've lost to go back to that. So Illinois uh, stealing. Alex has his hands full with the uh, who's coming and going from the Big Ten this year that he usually does multiple times on inside the hall. That that seems like a terrible exercise. And trying uh, to do the top twenty-five uh, with eighteen teams <laughs> and all this yeah. movement. Good luck, yeah. Alex and Dylan. Good luck. Yeah. Godspeed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, okay, let's do this. Here we go. Hey guys, it's Gene Steratore, CBS officiating analyst and retired Big Ten basketball official. You know I have never listened to the assembly call, and to be honest, I don't intend to. But if you listen. Make sure you ignore anything Ryan says about officiating. He's really good from the seat of his pants, but I wouldn't trust him on the court with a whistle around his neck. Time has proven him wrong on virtually everything. Take care. We'll talk soon. Like he's never just been curious once about Indiana basketball and wanted to tune in like one time. Nothing. No. Come on. Come on, Gene. Um, All right, guys. Let's talk about Indiana. Um, you know, obviously everybody knows we got Miles Rice, we got Bryson Tucker, we got Umar Balo. Um, let's just get your guys' opening thoughts, kind of the positives, the negatives, what you're excited about with Balo, kind of what questions you have. And then I want to present, a, you know, a little because look, let me preface it by saying this. A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, Indiana's going with two bigs again. Like, here we go. Playing with bigs can work. <laughs> Arizona, it has worked. Now, it may put a ceiling on your NCAA tournament potential as Arizona has struggled in the tournament, but they are 88 and 20 in the three years that Balo has been there. You know, and some of those, some of that time was playing with two bigs. Some of that time he was kind of the featured big. You know, it can work if you have the right roster construction around these guys. Um, And so we're going to talk about some of that and what Indiana may need to do uh, to help, uh, you know, to help make that happen. But Andy, let's get your, you know, just initial thoughts on. Uh, on on Balo and, and what he's going to bring to Indiana. Well, I think you the rebounding is the thing that really jumps out. Um, was, you know, top twenty, I think, in offensive and defensive rebounding percentage. I think an area that IU relied heavily on Khalil Ware, Khalil Ware for last year, TJD the year before. It's an area that Renew's shown some improvement in, but 
you know, still a bit undersized if you, uh, in that regard, I think that presents some challenges for him. So I think it immediately gives you that it immediately gives you the rim protection that you've kind of grown accustomed to, uh, over the last few years between TJD and, and where, and so I think he fills those boxes, uh, you know, for one, I think a guy who, I think you said this, I think anybody who's talked about him is, you know, you see him and he's more athletic, I think, than you, you might suspect looking at him initially. I think they've got to figure out how he's got good, feet. Um, you know, how they want to use him in pick and roll scenarios and different things like that. But I think you've got uh, a guy with a lot of experience, played a lot of high level basketball. It's not an up transfer. It's a, a guy who has played in uh, a, a power five league or power six league has played in big games and things like that. So I think you're, Looking at a a guy who's experienced in that regard, I think is is really positive. Just as you think about, you know, there's there's kind of, I think there's more of these kinds of transfers now than initially. I think it was viewed a lot of cases as guys ready to make the next step up and move into situations where you haven't necessarily seen them perform, and you're projecting what they might be able to do. I think in his case, and the case of of Rice, quite honestly, even though it's been less time with him, you walk in with a much better idea of what he's capable of. You still have to figure out how to maximize that within the system and different things like that. But at least you've seen it. Um, and we get into this conversation a lot. I feel like with IU, it's like, how many guys do you have that you know what you can expect on a game in and game out basis? He feels like a guy that you're going to know pretty well what you're going to expect from a game in and game out basis. And so I think that's good. Um, you know, the questions are not a guy who's shown the ability to really step away from the basket, doesn't shoot free throws well. Uh, I think those are all things that are there. And the general – you know, too big concept of, of figuring out it's another year of trying to figure out how to make that work, how that, how that impacts spacing, uh, all of those things. And so that's where you got to, you, you know, as, as much as it's hard and we've done probably not a great job of this over the course of time, like let the rest of the roster figure itself out so that you can see, do you have other pieces that can mitigate what some of his, shortcomings are or what some of the potential shortcomings are with lineups with him out there. Um, and I do think he's a guy it's been brought up, you know, he's played, he's played, you know, 25 ish, 20, you know, 28 ish minutes a game. Um, is he a guy that you can get? I, I don't, he's not going to end up in the TJD and wear mold no. of playing 38, 39 minutes probably can get him from a conditioning standpoint to be able to give you a little bit more than that if you need it. Um, but I, I think if you get up to 30, that feels like kind of the cap on, on what you'd be able to do there. And I think that's, again, puts the onus on who are you going to get as a backup big? What are you going to do if he, uh, he's a guy who hasn't gotten in foul trouble, but, um, you know, if Malik gets in foul trouble and he needs a rest, who do you have to be able to put in some of those scenarios? So those are things that you, you worry about, but I think you can mitigate some of the question marks you have about him by who else you can still fill out the roster with. Um, but like I said, like you said, really raises the floor um, with an established guy in a position that Mike Woodson has proven is vital for what he wants to do. Um, On both so, ends. Yeah, whether that changes this year, that remains to be seen. All we can go on is what he has done so far, and this is a, a pivotal role, and you filled it with the best guy in the portal to do it. So in that regard, I think you you got to feel positive and – and hope that the staff can figure out ways to maximize what he does well, minimize the areas that he struggles in, and and kind of work your way out from there. Ryan, what do you have to add, either on the positive or negative side? You know, the Ballo? thing about Ballo that I really like that Indiana hasn't really had is an incredible offensive rebounder to extend possessions, especially with a team that, sorry to bring this up, misses a lot of shots from the outside and things like that. If you have a guy who can extend possessions, it puts so much pressure on the defense as Indiana fans know from this past season when they really struggled on the defensive glass at times. So I think that that also has a really high putback percentage. He, he I mean, does he doesn't just extend and, them like he scores. Yes. Yeah. And so just the ability to do that and how many, if he's not getting the rebound, how many is he batting out? How many is he, is he affecting to the point where another teammate can get them? All of that stuff comes along with it. Um, what I'll say about it is obviously the addition so far, Rice and, and Balo have been great. Um, Indiana needs shooting and they haven't really improved that. And yeah, I know Jared, you've got your thing. Well, they're going to get better and that that's fine to have that theory. And in some ways you are correct. But Indiana has also been operating from a they'll get better mentality for the last couple of years, even during the Archie era, to be frank, to be frank. 
I would really like to see some guys come in who have been successful shooting in college. And maybe that's the next thing they get. Both things can be true. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I agree with that. But you've got the, you know, with, with, with Rice, you've got the, well, he'll get better. Okay, maybe he will, but is he getting two percentage points better? Is he getting eight percentage points? You don't know. I'd love but to But he see will it. also make other people better as That's well. That's fair. That's fair. But we've seen this team miss a lot of wide open looks over the last few years because they have guys who haven't done it before. And guys who haven't yep. done it before think a lot, take their time, sl- you know, slowly process things, get guys who have done it and are established and have the confidence to do it. Even Miller cop, when you got him, he was coming off a down season from three and it took him a long time to figure it out. And so I just would love to see them. And I think the next three, even if it's a big, I think you should get somebody who can step out on the floor or who has in the past stepped out on the floor. And, and to be fair, like a lot of the names circulating around now are those guys, you know, Connor yep. Seijin, Kind of seems like that's actually turning away from Indiana a little bit right now. Yeah, but I him, Hummer Kaus from Evansville, the kid from Grace College, Elijah Malone, even, you know, those two guys are both six nine, six ten guys who one of their big skills is the is ability to out. shoot. Yeah. You know, so it does seem like they are targeting that. And they're more, they're and honestly, sense. they're more a fit at the four than Malik Renu currently is. And in that lineup, if you have to sit Ballo you can slide Malik down to the five and put them on the perimeter. And it's a, it's a more seamless fit. So I think whoever yeah. they add now has to be able to put the ball in the basket from the perimeter. I just, I, I, that's the thing missing. And that's been the thing missing. And we've, we've been like, okay, you know, hoping a prayer it'll get better. And I agree with you that a guy like Rice will get better. It's just, to what degree is it enough? And and we haven't seen it happen yeah. enough for Indiana because the team ability to not only shoot and make at a high level has not been here. And and even in you know last season, not this past season, the season before, they had a decent percentage. They didn't shoot enough because the guys didn't have enough confidence to shoot. And so it, I would love to see them get somebody who's a gunslinger who has shot before, who has made at a high level. Dump the money on them. That's the thing you're missing right now. And honestly, it's been the thing they they have been missing. So that's that. Is, that should be the. And part. it's a vicious cycle because it also is part of what makes it a hard sell for some of those yep. guys. You know, and look until I, you get I do, that guy, you haven't had that guy. You know, <laughs> like it's well, and that is why I think this season for McKenzie and Baco is so important. Yep. And I, I do. I take your point. We do need better shooting. I do think that even without squinting, I think you can make a case for why the shooting efficiency will be better. Because McKenzie and Baco has every hallmark you could want of a guy who's going to jump up to somewhere I between agree. 38 to 42 percent this season. You know, same thing with Rice. If they get Kanan Carlisle, who is coming in for a visit, you know, he's similar to where he shot 32 percent last year, and his percentage was really dragged down by having to kind of take some bad ones. Just on catch and shoot, he was a lot better. You know, and so, right. but again, to your point, it would also be nice to just have seen it before and not have to project it. And you're just and. You're- you're like, like I said, you're just expecting it to happen. And and again, I agree that it'll happen, but how much is it going to be enough of a development in the positive direction? And again, with that, you're just saying, I don't know, but if you get a guy who's done it, you could say we can rely on that. And, and so I think that's the difference. The other thing would be nice too. It matters a lot less if they're going to shoot them as infrequently as they do. So it'd also be nice to shoot more. And this leads me Andy into, you know, what I want to talk about You know, I think if you're going to get Balo, he is going to be a centerpiece of what you're doing. Like, you don't get him and him not be a centerpiece. And so, you know, I think when you look at him and you look at Renew together, they both are tremendously skilled and bring a ton to the table. And in a lot of matchups, especially early in the season, they should just be able to dominate with no problem. You know, but obviously when you get against better teams, especially in tournament play, you're going to be able to have to do some different things. And so I think it's instructive to look at what Arizona has done to have efficient offenses, playing with Balo, playing with a couple of bigs. And there's a couple of things that really stand out. And I'm not going to get into all the different numbers. Just trust me that, you know, that that the numbers back this up. But there are some really stark differences between how Indiana plays and how Arizona plays. And I think there's, you know, some that I think are on a positive side and some that are on a negative side. The negative ones that stand out right away are Arizona posts up, you know, just looking at last year, they posted up four or five percent of the time less than Indiana. And even when you have 
a a terrific post score like a Trace Jackson Davis or a Balo, that is still one of the least efficient play types that there is because the only potential that you've got there is to get two points, you know? And so, you know, typically even really, you know, like Balo, I think his efficiency on post-ups was like 0.95 points per possession, which is really good, but it's less than putbacks. It's less than cuts. It's less than his efficiency as a, as a role man in the pick and roll. And the other thing that you notice with Arizona is they didn't take a whole lot of long twos. Indiana, on the other hand, takes a ton of long twos. And so those two subtle differences, seemingly subtle differences, are where a lot of hidden efficiency can come. You know, the other thing Arizona did is they got into transition and ran more pick and rolls than Indiana. You know, I think it's fair to assume that the post-ups and the long twos, because it's been so consistent for three years, I want to see that before I believe it'll change for Indiana. But it has to, because it caps our ceiling. What I do think is fair to think is going to change because of Miles Rice and because of some of the guys they're getting, like a Bryson Tucker, who's comfortable getting in transition, Kanan Carlisle, who's comfortable with that, and running pick and rolls. I do think Indiana will get in transition more and run pick and roll more, um, which will certainly help. Uh, but what also needs to happen is those need to replace post-ups, not other shot types, and they've just got to stop taking so many long twos. It's the worst shot in basketball. It's just very hard to create an efficient offense that way. So, uh, I, I, like I said, I think it's instructive to look at what Arizona has done, and hopefully you know, there's some things there that Indiana can take and just tweak what their emphasis is offensively. They don't, you know, you can play through the bigs, you can do a lot of that stuff, and just by virtue of having better personnel, especially at the guard, position that's going to help but nothing is nothing is going to help enough if you're still posting up too much and taking too many long twos yeah i think it's interesting you look at i was just kind of as you were as you were going through that looking on on ken palm at the arizona stats you know the the constants from tommy lloyd's three years there is they've been in the top 20 in tempo every single year uh they've also been in the top 11 in adjusted offensive efficiency every single year and if you look across at what they've consistently done well, three-point shooting has always been in the top 80. Two-point shooting has – two of the three years has been in the top 10. So they're getting – to your point about you know two-point shots, they're getting good ones because they're making them at a high rate. Um, yep. And so they haven't necessarily shot tons of threes as a, as a part of their offense, although the threes they have shot, they've hit really well. Um, and, and the other thing you look at is two of the three years, they're top 20 in offensive rebounding, uh, rate. And, and that's something that Balo obviously has played a big role in. And so, and has also his ability on putbacks and things like that has probably helped drive the, the two point percentage up. So, yeah, I, I think it, it's hard because I think you're, you, everybody looks at, okay, you've plugged this guy, he's going to be in this role and this is what it's going to look like. And it's probably fair for people to make that assumption up until you see it um, because similar to what I'm looking at these numbers for Tommy Lloyd, it's been for three years. We've watched Mike Woodson for three years. You have some idea of what it is, but I do think there's things to be unlocked there as, as you look at it. And um, perhaps having more creators um, because really every year it's been a singular guy, it, you know, X and, and Jalen never played together enough to see what this could look like with multiple creators out there. Yeah. Um, and so if you're able to do that and unlock some things, and maybe it doesn't look the same, but um, I think it's okay to be excited about the guys you brought in and be, you know, go in with the assumption that the offense is going to look a lot like it has looked like from a post-up standpoint and whatever, because that's the personnel that you have until you see otherwise, and then you can adjust your expectations from there. But I think, I think being able to have multiple creators is the biggest thing that potentially unlocks that. And I think being able to get guys who are able to get downhill a little bit better and able to get better two point shots, uh, in, in a way that, you know, what you've seen from Arizona has translated to, to good in season results at the very least, not necessarily in the postseason for them, but, um, yeah. but yeah, no, I think, yeah, I mean, well, I was kidding to you, Ryan. I mean, just, you know, you you look at the projected top seven. And again, you know, Kanan Carlisle is coming in this week. We'll see what happens with him. Just because there's been a lot of positive chatter about him doesn't mean he'll end up committing. But if your top seven is Rice, Carlisle, Galloway, Mbako, Renew, Balo, and Tucker. Like, let's just say if that's the top seven. 
just on talent alone, that's a top 40 or 50 offense. Probably. And I think, and I think part of why we have gotten frustrated is because, you know, again, you always want to see guys be put in the best position to succeed. And you look at some of the things that Indiana is doing, you know, like the long twos and like the over-reliance on post-ups. And, you know, you see other teams that have similar roster constructions that don't do that. And you say, that could be us. And that's where the frustration comes. And so that's where, you know, if we continue to do those things, there's going to be a hard ceiling, no matter how good the talent is. But if we do make some of those subtle adjustments and, you know, whether it's going to the glass more and getting more putbacks, exchanging long twos for threes, you know, just posting up one or two percentage points less and running pick and rolls instead because you have the guys who can do it. There's, there's, there's just a lot of like little bits of efficiency you can get that really add up over the course of a full season. And if you do that, there's no reason that talent couldn't be a top 25, top 20 offense with you know, again, just doing some more of the things that you see the best offenses around the country do. Yeah, I, I we, you and I texted about it this week, and it was kind of, the, the thing kind of was, it's like, you know, you got more talent, I think, at point guard than you had last year, undoubtedly, and more ceiling oh at point guard, yes. 100%. The rest of the roster kind of looks the same. And now you'll get, Mbaki will, will get better, hopefully renew can step out and be more on the perimeter, but you're incrementally getting better. It's not like there has been a game changer plopped into the team yet. Now, Balo is great, but he's replacing a guy who was already I'd great. I'd say Rice, Rice compared might, to what we got last year, I 100%, would put Rice in that category. 100%. But you're also replacing a, a, you know, a guy who had he been there. I'm talking about also at the beginning of the season, not what we got throughout the year. But yeah. if you're walking in, um, yeah. the, the difference between... Xavier Johnson and Bryce is Xavier Johnson was a longtime veteran and you were hoping you would get that. But there isn't there isn't a a guy that's like, whoa, that's changing everything Indiana does, you know, on and right. on the roster. And so, like you said, the differences have to be incremental. I think they'll have more talent when this all shakes out and they have the transfer portal, but they're setting up to look very similar on the court, not again from a talent perspective, but the way they do things. So the changes, and you and I talked about it, the differences. The difference, I think, is going to hinge on two things, shooting and getting out in transition. And they have the guys nice. to get out in transition. If they land the guys, I think people think they're going to land. They need to play with more tempo. It's imperative that they play with more tempo because you're going to need to steal baskets that way when your half-court offense isn't as efficient as a normal college half-court offense because, as you said, a post-up is the least efficient thing you can do on the offensive end. So you need to steal those buckets in transition. You see, during Mike Woodson's time, you've seen them do that in fits and starts, but never consistently. It's never been an emphasis. Go. Get the rebound. Go. Run. You know, a lot of times it's, all right, if you get the rebound, you go. Instead of kick having your guard sprint up the floor, kick it to him and then go and then have a secondary option when it doesn't work, a, a secondary break setup or something with motion to get guys open because you're not always going to get just an easy layup. It's got to be sometimes you get in there, the defense sucks down to that guy and then there's other people in spots to get points. Indiana has to do that and they have to be able to hit threes. Those are the two things I think next season hinges on because you're going to have a lot of talent but you're also, it looks like, going to be stuck in a similar setup where you're just hoping, well, let's just be better this year. It's like, no, you got to change the way you're doing things too. And I think that the talent is there to do that. It's just a matter of what the emphasis is. Let me clarify one thing. The numbers I was talking about are finishing a possession on a post-up. You can still play through the post. And like we saw a lot with Trace Jackson Davis, where if that guy in the post is then able to find someone for a spot-up shot, that doesn't count as a post-up. You played sure. through the yeah, post. Yeah. We're talking about actually, and, and this is where I, know, I think I know exactly what if, you meant, but that's going to be, well, I just want to make sure for the, the listeners, focus, this offense, I just yeah, want to make sure, be, but this is he's, also, he's where not I doing the show just for you though, Ryan. So you just have to <laughs> understand. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's people listening. <laughs> yeah, We're live. I know it's Cu crazy. Couple. Yeah. Wow. But I, I, I do, really brush my hair, <laughs> but Andy, the, you know, this is where, and look, Balo, when the ball goes into him, he, this is not a guy who's getting a lot of assists. When the ball goes to Balo, he's looking to score. This is where I think Malik Renu is so important for next year. Because we saw growth in his three-point shot. He's talked about this offseason, how hard he's going to work on it. If he can be a 35% guy to where he's credible out there, and Andy, if he can improve his decision-making, recognition of the doubles, and willingness to pass out of the post instead of 
being so stubborn on trying to score through two or three people, that's another place I think where you can see some of this improvement. And so, you know, I do think it needs to come from the guys they get in the portal, but improvement from Malik Renew and McKenzie and Baco to me is just as important as that. Because if, if Baco's out there shooting 40% from three and Renew takes the next step in his game, you open up a whole lot of new stuff now that when you add on a Rice and you add on a Balo, things start to make a lot more sense. And again, it's a whole lot of projection. Some of the stuff will happen, some won't. But these are some of the things that if they do happen, you really start to see things improve for Indiana, even if you're just running the same stuff that you ran before. Yeah, I, I think you've got... I- the the sky's the limit for Mbako. I think what we saw from him was a slow progression of growth last year that by the end of the season, he was playing some of his best basketball, shooting it well. Uh, and I think if he continues that trajectory, he, he gives you such a weapon uh, on the wing, even, you know, from a shooting perspective that they really uh, have lacked and, and need a more knockdown guy who every time he lets it go, you feel like it's going to go in. And I think he, um, you know, got, moved in that direction over the course of the season. And and as you said, with Renew, um, being able to to be a little bit more diversified in the way that he is able to impact the game, uh, whether that's outside shots, we saw him in spurts be able to hit those, saw him struggle in others. And, and as you said, some of the decision-making and, and him developing, you know, a similar connection with Balos is what he ended up really having with, with Ware. Uh, he got him a lot of easy baskets last year with some of the lobs and things like that that he threw. So getting those guys to be able to play effectively together with Balo, a, a guy who's different than Ware, um, or, or has been used differently. Um, and, and so how those guys can can work together becomes really important because they're going to be on the floor together a lot. Talk a lot about how much the lineups, when you know those guys were together versus when they weren't, uh, and how that impacted things last year. And part of that was a function of depth and, and all that. But um, I do think it'll be interesting to see how those two are able to play together and how that might look different than the way that Malik and, and Khalil complemented each other. Yeah, the last thing that we should talk about that I think is going to be really important is the bench. Mike Woodson likes to use his bench, especially early in the season. Now, he pairs that down as we go. But we've seen in November and December, he likes to play four or five of those bench guys at the same time. And last year, it killed Indiana. I mean, any lineup analysis that you do, if there are more than two bench guys out there, it almost doesn't matter what the other combination is. It was not just bad. It was like horrid. Like we're talking about differences in like 30, 40 points in net rating, which means that you're 30 or 40 points worse per 100 possessions. You know, and... It just it is what it is. And we talked about it from day one, how the the bench pieces just didn't make sense as a lineup together. Well, you know, to your point, Ryan, if you're at a a point now where either Galloway or a guy like Carlisle is, you know, kind of your lead guard from the bench unit, you've got a Bryson Tucker who, you know, he's a freshman. We don't quite know what to expect, but he's going to be able to score in transition. He's going to be able to score on cuts like he's going to bring some stuff to you. You know, you've got, you know, then who else do you get? You know, if you get a big who can shoot, uh, you know, if you get another wing, like, it, and by the way, someone asked, why is the Siegen trending away from Indiana? I, mean, I don't have like a whole lot of insider knowledge on this. He came for a visit and didn't commit and is going on other visits. That is, that tends to just not be a great sign. Now, it doesn't mean he won't still commit. Maybe he will, but you would feel better if he committed on the visit. So that's really all I mean by that. Um, it's not that we're out or anything like that, but you got to have a bench. Let's put it this way. None of us endorse the all sub lineups. <laughs> we all would like to see things more staggered. But again, if we're just trying to take Mike Woodson and what we've seen through three seasons, if you're going to do that, then you've got to have scoring. You've got to have creation. You've got to have some rim protection and rebounding. None of those lineups made sense last year. They need to this year. But you also need guys who can plug in with specific skills that help complement the starters. And they didn't have enough of that last year either. Um, you know, and so if you have a shooter, just use a siege as kind of the archetype. If you have a guy like him out there, that's really good. That can help your starting lineups. Having three guys who could lead your offense ensures you against injury. Make sure that you always have one of those guys out there. Make sure that if Trey Galloway is exhausted at the end of the game, you know, you've got other guys who can do it. So that's the other place, which last year, Ryan, just almost any way you look at the bench, whether it was as just subbing in to play with the starters or playing as a full bench unit, it killed Indiana. 
And so these next few additions are massive. Like they are really, really important, even if they're not going to draw the headlines. And it's nice to have a guy like Leal who showed you he can be productive. You know, Cups, I don't know what to expect from him as a sophomore, but he at least showed he can make open jump shots and he's got experience. Ja'Kai Newton is a major wild card. So it's, but that's pretty good for, if those are the guys at the end of your bench, that's pretty good. But if they can get an eighth, the ninth, the tenth guy that can go out and really play competent, consistent basketball, again, when you're just talking about all these little things that add up to efficiency or inefficiency on offense and defense, the bench was just huge for Indiana last year. And so that's why these these next few additions are massive because they need to make sense complementing your main guys. But if Indiana is going to play this way, then they have to make sense as a unit because otherwise you're killing your efficiency early in the season. And that stuff comes back in March to really matter. You can debate whether it should or not, but it does. Yeah. So, you know. I, I'd imagine on the Asijian front, he's just not going to be guaranteed a starting spot. And he probably wants to make sure he's going to play. And I think that's probably what the fit is. Indiana has a lot of guys lined up to visit that are not similar to him necessarily, but play the ro- the position he would play. And if you're not guaranteed to start, go to the place that, you know, you feel that. And and if he's, he thought he was coming in to maybe take the two guard role and Indiana said, we've got somebody earmarked for that. That would, that would be, I think a reason to go somewhere else. Yeah. We're, we're a guy like him. We don't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just yeah. Reading the tea leaves. Yeah. What's interesting with him is I, I, I think I knew anecdotally from watching Wisconsin that he wasn't playing a lot, but you go look at the game log, like he really wasn't playing a lot. And he um, did as a freshman. He played quite a bit as a freshman. There was a, a stretch of games where he played a little bit more, but like the complete lack of minutes that he got for them. He did have an injury, I think, a back injury. That affected uh, yeah, some of that. but, I, yeah, but then, even, even so, there were really yeah. never stretches, it seemed like, when he – he played consistently. So I don't know what the, I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend to know what the, the backstory is there, but like pretty much from the get go in the season, I mean, he only played more than 10 minutes a game or 10 or more minutes a game. Nine times. I'm trying to do this really quick yeah. here. So I might be off. I, mean, I think part of it, while you two, add, I think but, part of it is they wanted to get more athletic with store and with Blackwell. Yes. And then Klesmit became their knockdown shooter. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And so they just, you look at, you look at his freshman year though, 11.7 points and 36% from three as a freshman. I mean, and then to drop off to 3.2, he played in 33 games last year. You know, it wasn't like he missed two months and then had to try and get back in the rotation. So it's just odd what, whatever happened there. And, and maybe it was just other guys stepping up and being more athletic and being more what they were looking for. You're, you're probably right, Jared. But um, yeah, I'm just not sure how if you're him, you go from that scenario to like thinking that you would and, you know, it's all conjecture. But like, how would you go from that to a starting role in a team? And you're saying everyone thinks they should be starting. Well, (laughs) I think that's I'm sure that's true. But yeah, I think if he wants to do that, I'm not sure transferring within the league is what would make sense. I mean. Yeah, if he thinks he should be starting, he might need to go to the Missouri Valley or something like that. But that's, that's and you know, he may have just visited Indiana because it's, it's it's home. Yeah. You know, and it, yeah, and, I, th- uh, I think he that, got tried to get sold on the fit. I, yeah. I think. And, and I think that's where this part of the roster building exercise becomes interesting slash challenging, right? Like you're assuming the Carlisle thing happens. You, you're not pitching starting spots to guys. No. So you have to figure out how can I get guys who are going to buy into this role, but be able to play it successfully and potentially play an expanded role in the case of injury or different things like that. And so I, I think there's a little bit of trying to figure out how you do that. You've got so many guys in the portal who all, to your point, Ryan, think that they're, you know, the grass is greener and I'm going to get this role and finding the guy with the right mindset that's going to be able to do that. Um, And sure, the NIL plays a part of that. I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't. But at the end of the day, a lot of these guys want to play. Um, This might be your last chance to really play competitive basketball, and how do you want to play out that time? And so I I think I'm not going to downplay the challenge of, of trying to get the best guys in the portal to come. But this is the part that really starts to get interesting. You've got a clear pitch to Abala when he comes in of here's guys who have played your role, been su- the role we're going to put you in, been successful, all those things. We can help you grow. Rice, 
we're going to hand you the keys as the point guard. You know, we put a lot on yeah. guys, show them the Jalen mm-hmm. Hutchifino film of what we, you know, we put on the guys in these, this program. It's like, these are the spots that, you know, might make you or break you in various games throughout the season, but are hardest to fill because you can't, can't promise the things that you can, you know, and the pick and the path to playing time is not as clear to being able to show guys in this. So it really becomes about the personality and the fit of the guys at that point of what they're willing to do. And do they want to be a part of this and whatever? So like, I find this part will be as fascinating to me as the rest of it, because there are clear needs. One of them is clearly like, you know, a backup big, who are you going to get in that role? A lot of the guys they've talked to, so far was still when there was the potential to start there. That's not there. Does that mean guys aren't interested? I wouldn't blame anybody if they would. It's not a commentary on the program or the staff or anything else if they're not. Um, but how do you get guys who can come in and like fill those spots and be able to take those minutes? And and I think there's, you know, I think the shooting part of it, you know, getting another guard who's a, a known commodity as a shooter, I think that's probably a, a you know, still a, a little bit easier story to tell, but I think that's where it really gets interesting and challenging at this point of you've nailed down some of the big needs. Now your shopping list contains some things that are maybe less essential uh, or, or less desirable for the people coming into it, but, but maybe are essential for your team. And so uh, it's going to be an interesting couple of weeks in that regard to figure out the kinds of guys that they can get to, to fill in those positions, buy into those roles uh, and still have what, we talked about with Balu is like a proven track record that you're going to be coming to do it, that you're not going to have to kind of squint to figure out how does this work? Well, ironically, given our discussion just now about the bench, maybe being able to say, Hey, our bench gets minutes here early in the season. Maybe that does help with some of those guys, at least knowing that there is a history of playing those guys. And if, you know, if that's the case, then that'd be great. I still, don't think it's a great strategy, but hey, you've got to use what you do to your advantage. And so much of mm-hmm. recruiting is sales, so spin it in your direction. Yeah. Um, sure. By the way, one name we haven't talked about it much. Elijah Malone. I think he's from Grace College in AIA. And I, I, yeah, but I, th- I think he's on a visit now, or he's coming this weekend. Mm-hmm. He's a really interesting player. It's obviously tough to project guys from that level, but if you want to just go watch some video, he's a good shooter, relatively good athlete. You know, I have no idea how interested he is or how if he's a take for Indiana or any of that. But he's the kind of guy, you know, if you get him as your backup big, really, you know, would give you some different options, Um, especially if Balo is out. You're going to be playing smaller and and kind of more of a modern style. Now, you're going to give up some things on rebounding and that kind of stuff. But he's a guy, maybe go watch his film um, if you're just looking for a guy to watch uh, because he's a really interesting prospect who I think everybody kind of has a hard time knowing how it would translate. Um, but we'll see a name to know any final thoughts on this guys. Obviously we're going to, it's only April. We've got a whole lot of time between now and November to talk about all this. Just a mere so six we apologize in advance to figure out, yeah. if we, if we cover similar ground on a future show. Um, but you know, or it'll, it'll evolve obviously as we know what the pieces are. Yeah. So, yeah. But who knows? And I mean, there's still names coming in. How much longer is the portal open? There's still like two weeks, right? Yeah, I think it's a couple of weeks, and grad transfers you can get in whenever, anytime you want. you want. And I mean, and just today, Chucky Hepburn, AJ Hogard, Jeremy Roach, like there's really good names. TJ Power, like there's really interesting names still coming out. So keep your eyes peeled because there is no off season in college basketball anymore. Basically, um, certainly not right now. That is true. All right, coming up on Assembly Call Radio, we will say bye to Andy because I think he has to go in here pretty soon. But then we are going to dive into the mailbag. Lots of good mailbag questions. We'll hit those and talk a little bit about the Doyle, Kate, and Clark debacle. Stick with us here on the Assembly Call. Mr. Bottoms, you want to bounce right. now, or do you want to hang around for the middle? Yeah, break? I'll probably just I'll probably just go ahead. Uh, I record in the basement, and uh, my mother in law is staying with us, and the oh. bedroom that she sleeps in is down here. So, uh, <laughs> not always a ideal time to be uh, to be down. Time here. to earn some brownie points and get the heck off the air. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyway, wake up no, tomorrow uh, talking about the nightmare of Andy talking about Indiana going with two bigs. Absolutely, again. nobody. Today. Yeah, nobody You're needs that. Yeah, nobody needs that. So. Anyway, they're doing now, that again. Uh, curious to uh, <laughs> curious to hear you guys. Yes, but it could the... work this time. <laughs> <laughs> curious to hear you guys' thoughts on the Doyle thing. I know Ryan clearly has 
Yeah, right. Opinions. <clears throat> As in, he demanded whole, space to and ready this to, to go. Us. So, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I've been waiting. Yeah, oh, he's been waiting. An oh, epic, boy. an epic after dark rant to come. It sounds like. Oh, we can bust out the AC. Oh, no, after we're not. Music. We're not doing after dark. This is going to be in the show, Jared. Uh-huh. Like, it, I, I want to do it in the next segment. It's all the same thing. We just dress it up with music. No, I mean, stuff. I, I want to do. I want to address it off the top because I, I feel like after dark has to be fun. This is not fun. This is not going to be no, funny. It's like anti-fun. Okay, fine. I guess you're right. Jared's going to do the, anti-dark. Yeah, well. after dark is going to be the Jared, Jared singing the spelling song. I've got to remember that song. Got to give the got to yes. give the people what they want. So anyway. yeah, that's true. All right, good seeing you guys. I'll talk to you later. See you, man. Yeah, later, buddy. All right, let's no, play don't music. sing, Jared. I was kidding. Please don't. Oh, okay, <laughs> fine. I won't sing. <laughs> fine. Uh, all right, here we go. <clears throat> What's up, y'all? It's Devontae Green, giving you the green light to watch Assembly Call after every IU game. Just don't listen to their opinions about shot selection. Remember, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Go Hoosiers. If there was a Devontae Green, he would fit great on the roster Indiana's building right now. As kind of your be- as a bench offense guy shooter. I mean, he was a little inconsistent, but he still shot 37. Okay, but overall, (laughs) the numbers on the season were good. But he evened up. Yes. And so, but you could ride that hot hand. And that's kind of what you're looking for. Because, again, they've got some guys who can make shots. I would love a consistent bench. That's all I want is a guy, maybe only make one three, but you do it every game. Like, I I would rather have that than volatility. You kind of want both, I think. You kind of want a guy or two that could get red hot that you ride. But then, yes, also a couple guys that you could just count on them. But I kind of feel like Leal's become that guy a little bit. Like, you know what you're getting from Leal. He can make an open shot. He could even play the four in a smaller lineup. So, and that, you know, I, I will say, just I guess to put a period on, on what we just said, got to see it all come out. But the big problem last year is Indiana basically had one way to play, and that was it. You know, and what they're building now, if they get the type of guys we think they're going to get, I think they're going to have a lot more options for different styles they can play based on the game that they're in. I would and agree. we just haven't seen that a lot under Mike Woodson, in part, I think, because of roster construction, in part because of injury, in part because of stubbornness. You know, I think it all plays into it. But I think if you can get the roster and the talent to be able to do it, it you know, you're just going to have more options. Um, you know, and that would be huge for Indiana. Anyway. We'll keep talking about that as we go. All right, so you want to talk Doyle before we get to mailbag questions? Yeah. Um, okay, well, the the floor is yours. I mean, I yeah, just go. So, uh, as everybody has said, what happened? Do we need incredible. to reset this? Or does everybody go ahead, know you, you reset it, and I'll dive in. So you're involved. Okay. So, Caitlin Clark was doing her introductory press conference for the Indiana Fever. It was broadcast live on television, on the internet, everywhere. And when it came Greg Doyle's turn, as he will often do, he will kind of make a show of his question. Instead of just asking the question, he will kind of make a show of it, kind of try and shine the spotlight on himself. In this case, he did the little heart, you know, hand symbol uh, that Clay, that Caitlin Clark does to his family. Um, and I don't remember exactly what he family. said in the sequence of it, but he essentially, you know, so said, she said, she said, oh, you like that? And he said, I like that you're here. I like that you're yes. here. In and kind of said, an awkward yeah. way. And she said, so I, like in a fawning way almost. And she said, uh, yeah, I do that to my family. He's like, well, if you do it to me, we'll be okay. Like, or something yeah. along those lines. We'll, we'll get along great. Um, and she brushed it off. She handled it. Great, she handled it. I great. Say. She handled it. And he asked another weird question later where he was talking to the coach. And he said, you've just been given the keys to that. What do you do? And he was referring to Caitlin Clark, who was sitting right there. It's like, oh, I didn't even hear that. Yeah, that Jeez. was an additional one. So, all right. As a journalist, I am acutely aware that some people do not like journalists and don't like the lion's share of us because of what a small percentage who are in the spotlight do. Um, what Greg Doyle did yesterday was not just weird. And, and in the end, that because a lot of people are focusing on that last line where he's like, you know, uh, you do it to me and we'll get along fine, which was insanely creepy and weird. The entire exchange was wildly unprofessional. Like 
you are a journalist interviewing a subject. Yes, it's an open press conference, but essentially you are interviewing a subject that you are going to be covering. Yep. You do not do a heart symbol to them and then fawn over them over how great they are, which you can feel that way, but that's your opinion that should then come out in the column that you have. Talk about how great she is. Talk about how much you respect her and all of those things. In a press conference, your job is to ask your damn question and move on. You That whole thing, first of all, it took away from Caitlin Clark's moment being introduced to her new city. And it made it about you. And you're doing this showy thing of like, I love you. And then like, I'm just happy you're here. Like, what does that add to the press conference? Because when you're at a press conference, it's not just for you. It's for all of the journalists in the room can use the quote that you get from a question. And there are limited questions to ask. And if you take the time and make it all about you, there was no good question asked there. It was just him being weird. And, and did this, the, you know, if it was a one-time thing and you're like, you maybe know we what? shouldn't even say weird. It was just, it was inappropriate. It was inappropriate. unprofessional. That's what I and mean. Inappropriate yes. is, is the perfect word for and uh, incredibly unprofessional and unprofessional from the jump, like the hearts, making the heart symbol at somebody you're covering. Like, are you going to like, I loved watching Trace Jackson Davis play. I'm not making the heart symbol to Trace Jackson Davis. If I'm asking him a question. And the only reason Doyle thought that was okay to do was because Caitlin Clark is female. And is a woman. And he was trying to be cutesy and make a show of it. Greg, shut up. Like, just shut the F up and ask your question. That is what you are there for. You're not there to make a scene, which you do quite often. Don't let your opinion get into the press conference. That's what the Indie Star has given you the column for. When he was asking a question, I, I can't remember which which Colts coach it was. I think it might have been Chuck Pagano. He was asking a question of them in a virtual press conference. I believe, I and again, I think it was a virtual press conference. And he said, he was trying to say his question. He said, you know, really, it just doesn't look, it looks like you guys don't know what the hell you're doing. And then he asked a question. It's like, Stop editorializing during a press conference. You have inches worth of space to editorialize in the newspaper. That is where you do that. When you ask a question of Purdue, he, we know how much he respects Matt Painter and Zach Eady and those guys. He's expressed that in his columns. But he'll ask questions in press conferences about how great they are. Like That's not where you, at, where you say that. You ask a straight question. They answer it. You get your quote, and then you insert your quote into your opinion about how great they are. Uh, here's an example of, of, of to turn this around. I have been very critical of Mike Woodson's system. If I was in a press conference, and I have been in press conferences with Mike Woodson, if I was in a press conference, I would not get the microphone and stand up and be like, hey, Mike, your offensive system sucks. What are you doing to improve it? I would say, hey, Mike, offensively, you guys are ranked 80th in the country or whatever it is. And today you scored X amount of points. What tweaks can you guys make to make that more efficient to get that better? I wouldn't say your offense sucks. So be, why would I? Why wouldn't I do that? Because that's a look at me moment where I want everybody in the room paying attention to me, and the headlines are going to be about me. And then the other thing, I read Greg Doyle's apology column, and he said, "Though now I get it, clearly does not." clearly does not because here's the thing it's been years of this kind of behavior and he has not changed and he could say well i'm just being me well being you is wildly unprofessional and i don't i'm not someone who calls for people's jobs i don't think he should be i don't i don't it's not my job to sit there and say he should be fired but if he doesn't have like a come to jesus moment where it's like hey maybe i should be more professional and ask straight questions instead of trying to put on a show when I'm doing this, if you respect Caitlin Clark and you want to tell her in person, pull her aside after the press conference, say, Hey, you know what? I really respect what you're doing for women's basketball. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're in Indianapolis. I'm really looking forward to, to, to covering you or reach out Even to there. her. Hey, I, I think it's kind of fun how you do that thing with your family. Like that's kind of a cool thing after, like if after. it's a one on one thing, yes. you're in a professional setting, not a personal setting and you're making it personal. And so uh, again, I, I know a lot of people at the Indy Star that I very much respect who work there and who make yes. decisions there. And they have decided to give him a lot of rope to do this kind of thing. 
I've met Greg Doyle twice in person. I, I sat next to him at a game a couple of years ago. He was, in, he was very nice to me. It wasn't, there was no, you know, I, I wasn't like, you're a jerk. You know, like he was very nice to me. I have nothing personal against him, but stop being unprofessional in professional settings. Because you know what? The other thing is that irks me. It makes the rest of us look bad because so many people today are saying male journalists do not know how to handle a female athlete. You know what? A lot of us do. It's that dude whose comments are going to be cycled forever that screwed this up for everybody. So yeah. that's my thought on it. And it's really damn annoying. Whenever a journalist screws up and people screw up in professions all the time, they screw up in every profession. It's magnified when you're a journalist because people are waiting to pounce on journalists who screw up. It's the way our world is these days. But people screw up in every profession. Good people who are good at their jobs screw up in every profession. So it, it's it, the, the spotlight is on people to screw up. Plenty of people do not screw up. And whenever someone does screw up, though, and repeatedly screws up, we all get lumped in with them. And it's not fair to the rest of us who work really hard and act the right way. And so I just hope, and he'll never watch this, but I hope that Greg Doyle takes this moment and looks in the mirror and realizes, hey, I've had a lot of these high-profile incidents where I've been wildly unprofessional. Maybe I need to change. And I hope that's what it turns out to be. But if this happens again, how is the Indy Star letting it happen? That's what I have to say. If something like this happens again, how are you letting it happen? Because there's a lot of enabled. great people who I mean, work there. Yeah. Well, and that, so I echo everything you said. Excellent. Excellent. Rant I've there. clearly been thinking about it for a while. Well, but this is the thing. I think a lot of us have been thinking about it for a while. And that is what ticks me off is this really should have been a great day for our city and our state. And I still consider Indiana my state, even though I, I haven't lived there. I grew up there. I have roots there. I love Indiana. This was a really cool moment. And all people are talking about, instead of Caitlin Clark and the fever, all people are talking about moment. is this awkward thing that happened. You know, awkward, unprofessional. You know, you know, there's a lot of adjectives that you could use to describe it. And, you know, I, I, we like Zach Osterman. We like Dustin DePirac and a lot of the guys that are there at the Indy Star. And, of course, they're not going to comment on this. But I don't like that this is going to reflect poorly on them simply because they're part of the Indy Star. Now, people who know them aren't going to say that. But, you know, I, I, I am the sure. The whole paper looks bad today. It does. Yes. And it's not there. And it's not anybody's and, fault. One dude. And I understand why. Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the paper itself has enabled this. You're right. It's not the first time something like this has happened. And it's just, it's just really unfortunate that now again this great moment was ruined and it just reflects poorly on the on the on the city and state and there's no reason for it at yeah. all none so just and and I'll, and I'll say this I don't know Greg I mean we've met twice he was very as I said very nice to me he could be the best guy in the world I don't know but the way that people are seeing you is professionally and how you act and that reflects on your paper and it reflects on you both and so again this is not an isolated incident. And when it keeps happening, this was probably the worst and most high profile, certainly. But when it keeps happening, it poorly reflects on the people around you too, who are allowing you to stay in that position. If you care about the people around you, stop. Like it's, it's, it's not hard to act normal and professional in a press conference. He had to think that through that. This is what I'm going to do when it, this is, it wasn't a spur of the moment thing. It was clearly thought out and a little playful thing. He's like, this is a good idea. This is what I'm going to do. When you're talking to the Colts coach and you say, you guys don't look, look, know what you, he knew that was not the right thing to do. And he still did it. And, and again, there've been other instances as well. I'm not going to go through them all, but like, that's not something I mean, he went through a lot of them in his apology. Yeah, that's, that's not something that spontaneously happens. It was planned out. And yeah. if it's the it's the old email thing, if even a kernel in your brain of a kernel corner of your brain says, maybe I shouldn't send this email, do not send the email like it's, you know, yeah. and it's if, if and if nothing is clicking on to him saying that might be inappropriate or unprofessional, that's a problem. And that's a bigger yeah. problem than anything that happened yesterday. So, and I've, you know, some people have had issues with Doyle because of things that he's written and things that he's done, as you've said, you know, you sat next to him a couple of times when I was running Midwest sports fans and he was at CBS. He was incredibly nice to us. Yeah. He would link to our stuff I mean, we would email back and forth. Now, that's been a while. He wouldn't remember yeah. me now, but this is not, you know, there's not a bad person. It's just a bad choice by, you know, person who should know better. 
And yeah, I, and I'm not sitting on – yeah, and I definitely want to make that clear. I'm not sitting here saying Greg Dole is a bad person. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that his actions reflect poorly on him, the paper, and the profession. And I'm part of that profession. And it really irks me. And and that's not the main reason I'm upset about this. Other people have said the main reason everybody should upset about this, and they've done it very eloquently. I'm adding to it's not just that. That's the worst part is the you know the perceived misogyny and things like that is the worst part. But it's also just incredibly unprofessional and reflects poorly on him in his job, not just as a person. And And I think that that is... Again, not the part I'm the most upset about. I think everybody's the most upset about what we're all, what everybody has been talking about for the last two days. But yeah. it, it's it's just an additive on top of that, and and it's not it's not cool, man. It's really not because cool. no. you know what? If I acted like that at my current job, I would no longer be at my current job. Once, once, maybe you get a warning, but one time, I would yeah. probably be fired. And I would deserve yeah. to be fired. Um, if you're looking for more of a national perspective on this, I thought the Press Box podcast had a really nice conversation about it. Brian Curtis and he, uh, Derek Thompson was his yep. guest, which, by the way, and I love that podcast. It's a great uh, podcast. I've been trying to I've been trying to set up a, a podcast between Brian Curtis and Galen Clavio talking about sports media forever. I've tweeted them about this like three or four times, and then Galen just texts me today and says I had lunch with Curtis a month ago. Could have told me. You didn't turn a microphone you know, on? <laughs> turn a microphone on? Something. I love those two guys. Anyway, if you're interested in sports media and you've never listened to the Press Box podcast, it's a good Brian one. Curtis is great. So just a recommendation there. All right. You want to roll through some of these questions? Sure. Let's knock them out. Okay. Some of these we probably talked about in our previous um, segment, but let's go. Okay. So this question from Joey. How would you rate our offseason if our only additions were Tucker, Rice, Carlisle, Ballo, and two replacement level transfers. And I asked him to specify that. And he said, let's say for the sake of this exercise, one of them is a replacement level big man who can eat minutes but doesn't provide anything great. Uh, so I guess kind of Peyton Sparks-ish. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the other uh, one to two guys are roughly Cups Leal level players, you know, which is they're they're decent but don't necessarily like, you know, have, you know, some great skill that you're putting in there. So they're, I would say replacement level would be probably less than a guy like a Cision, who at least you project to have an elite skill of shooting yeah. or at least a, an above average skill of shooting. Uh, How would you rate that off season? A B I'd say. Yeah. Cause you've added some more athleticism at the guard spots. You've added some more creation at the guard spot. You also added two guys who shoot a lot of long twos. If you get Carlisle and rice, uh, which Man. we've seen before By the way that I'm actually, I'm really worried about that. Yes. Rice yeah. was in the 95th percentile on long twos last season. And Indiana has been in the 95th percentile for two straight seasons. Yeah. And, and Carlisle that worries me. I think Carlisle, some like 43% of his shots were long twos. Uh, I think so. I saw somebody tweet that out. Yeah. I might not be exact. Maybe if those guys point. aren't the only creator on the court, it'll help because I'm sure some of those are just end of shot clock type things. Of course. Yeah. And they were, they but, were the guys who had a lot of the ball in it, but, but yes, man, we I, take a lot of those at Indiana. I know. And it's, <laughs> so, you're just, I know. you're anyway. just hammering your head on the, on the table every time. But, <laughs> but yeah, so I would say about a B because I do think that you have gotten better at certain spots. I think that about ba Abalo and, uh, um, and, and where there's some interchangeability there where maybe overall you're getting about the same with, you know, where's offense was certainly a much higher upside than, than Balo's, but Balo is more rugged. He's defensively, he's going to be able to play defense on some guys. Different. So I think you're kind of, I don't, I wouldn't call it a wash because also Balo is so, uh, is such a veteran. Um, but I don't think it's a huge, you know, massive improvement on what you already had. You had an NBA guy there. Um, I think getting Tucker off the bench, having some, an athletic guy off the bench is a big deal uh, who can score and has a lot of skill. Uh, still, again, needs to develop a shot, as we say with a lot of guys at IU. But if you got Rice and Carlisle, I think you're better at the guard spots. And I think you also get better by extension of having Galloway on the second unit instead of starting. Uh, I think that's his best fit. And I think he can affect the game just as much from that position. Yeah, I think More I would agree. Consistent. I would go B, maybe even B. I think I think B is right because you look at that, your top seven, eight is solid and really good, you know, and so there may be some games where those replacement level players are not even playing, but in November and December with how Indiana likes to play, those guys are going to matter. Um, and just with depth, you know, if you have any type of injury, you need those guys to be able to step in and play. So I think I think I think they're at a B right now. 
you know, assuming that you get Carlisle, and now if you want to really make this kind of a home run grand slam type off season, um, you know, those guys need to be able to step in and really provide something, not just yeah. be replacement level. Because part of the problem last year was we had a lot of guys, you know, at replacement level or a little bit below, just in terms of the production that they provided. So, um, okay, John's question. This is John Ringer, who does all of our graphic work for the assembly call. We love John Ringer. Um, I'm, I'm going to preface this question by saying, just to make sure that everybody understands this, we are not, once the season starts, we are not going to make every game, even if it goes poorly, nope. some kind of referendum on Mike Woodson's job. We are not even going to have that conversation until the end of the season. Mike Woodson's the coach. Let's get the entire you know, body of work for this season, and then we'll reassess it. John's question is, and I think it's a fair one, especially to talk about now, what do you think needs to happen this coming season to keep Woody off of the hot seat? Because by any objective measure, he's entering the season on the hot seat. You might debate mm -hmm. how hot, but it's... Well, I would say seat. it's pretty solidly one of the hottest seats in the country. It, yes. Mostly because of the level of visibility. Not because he's been worse than other guys, but the level of visibility. Yes, um, yes. My oh, and opinion, he, he followed it up. Is simply making the tournament or getting to the second weekend enough? So I will say I think he has to compete for a Big Ten title. He has to be in that top group for a Big Ten title. I'd say you have to do it all year, not just sneak into the top four at the end of the year or something like that. He's got to have a squad that can contend all year. That's number one. Especially number two, in the Big Ten that is it seems very wide open. Yes. I mean, with yeah. Edie gone, anybody could win it, and it's going to depend on the transfer portal and all of these yeah. things that, that are working themselves out now. Um, so I would say they have to compete for a Big Ten title within a couple. And even, even TJD's senior year, you know, they were 12 and eight. I mean, it was a successful year. We've all said, you know, debated, you know, decent success. How was it? Did it live up to expectations? All of that stuff. But 12 and eight, when the team that wins it has 15 wins is not really competing, especially when mm. you beat them twice. Yes, we got screwed by the schedule. Horribly. It's true. I mean, absolutely. which I know is going to get lost to time, but it, it's, seem, it it's seems true. to happen every, every year though, anyway, but <laughs> Um, but no, being three games out of first place is not really competing and tying with a bunch of teams in the middle is not, you're not in contention for the title. You know, had you not beat Purdue twice, you're five games behind them. You know, I mean, it's, it's, so it's really, there's just such a distance between needs to be in contention for a big 10 title and you have to make the sweet 16. If you don't do both of those things with the amount of money being spent on players, I, I think you got to go. I, I just, I don't think. You have the uh, you have shown the upside in the program uh, to stick around, and I think that 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 will be the case. I think. I think what you just said is fair. I also think, in reality, because of how low the bar got set last year, I think there may be a willingness to look at something a little bit lower than what you just said as incremental progress that could be built upon moving forward with another, you know, strong NIL off season and all of that stuff. I mean, they would have going to be have like a how it happens and, and what it feels like, you know, they would have to have stuff. a monster recruiting class coming in, I think to fall short of those Maybe. things and keep him in. I, I, you cannot have a weak recruiting class and not reach those goals. There's n zero chance that he sticks around. Um, oh, I don't. I don't think it's zero chance. I, I. I think. I think there's going to be a willingness to see a successful season at somewhat less. Like even if it's okay, fourth or fifth in the Big Ten, and you make the tournament and win a game. I think because of how bad last season was, I think there's going to be a large faction I, that will consider that successful. I. I, I get what you're saying. I 100% disagree. There is a lot of consternation behind the scenes about the way things have gone. And with the amount of money spent, if you do not have high level success, I maybe I, I don't, maybe. especially, especially given who some people think they could have gotten as a replacement this time around. And maybe they, maybe they won't be able to get those people next year. You know, things change every year, but I, I think that there's going to be some, consternation about it continued and there and there's a lot of even though they're getting players there's a lot of skepticism behind the scenes about will this even make a difference so i and i think it could i honestly think it could i think next year could be a really good season i think they can reach those goals if they get the guys that it's kind of lining up that they could probably get or at least the type of guys to fill those roles i think next year the potential could be a very, will be there yeah, the, yeah there's no question 
And um, so I'm not, I'm not by saying this, I'm not saying that next year is going to suck. Be prepared. I'm just saying that I think that if it does and it doesn't reach those levels, um, I, I do think there's going to be a lot of, a lot of anger behind the scenes. And there already was this way, year. By the way, I, so I, I laughed at this. I don't know if you saw this. There was a, a Boston.com piece that came out and they were, I don't know if Brad Stevens like did a press conference or someone was asking him a question and someone asked him about, cause was, I think it was Seth Davis who tweeted out something yes. about like totally out of the blue about, Hey, Indiana maybe Brad Stevens. Be, yeah. like, no one's thinking about this. No one is talking about it. And Seth Davis just like out of the blue brings this up. So someone asked Brad Stevens about it and he gave this, you know, this interesting answer. You know, he didn't like, he just kind of went into talking about, you know, his goals with Boston and in the answer, he talks about, he said, I don't remember the exact line, but it was something to the effect of, you know, we're trying to win a championship here and just, you know, really focused on getting over that hump, <laughs> which is <laughs> like, Brad, Brad stay in Boston. I can't, I can't, <laughs> like, man. Like no, that is I, either unintentionally funny or the greatest mass hole line that he could use to basically yeah. just like, Absolutely. I just, I laughed so hard when I read that. No, And, and <laughs> you know, some people got into me about that because I was like, look, I think that that door, I think Brad completely closed that door the last time and Indiana went hard after him and he just decided, Hey, you know what? It's not for me. And, and that's perfectly fine. You know, like I, the guy, yeah. The, we are not bringing this up saying it has, <laughs> I just thought Seth Davis saying it was so out of the blue and ridiculous, but well, and the argument is, you know, people were like, he loves Indiana. I was like, he's more likely to come back and coach the Pacers than he is Indiana university. And it's not because he doesn't like IU. It's because of the lifestyle is really rough on college coaches. It's really rough. You don't rough. think he'd be interested in dealing with the transfer portal now? And he didn't like recruiting. Well, before? and somebody was trying to argue like, <laughs> well, it'd be way easier to get good fast. I'm like, yeah, but it's also way easier to lose your players that you spent a long time working hard. Like coaches hate, like people talked about Jay Wright for Kentucky. I was like, Jay Wright is so no happy way. right now. He is loving life. And I think Jay Wright, one of the best coaches in the last three decades in college basketball. But what was amazing. Jay Wright's brilliance? player development and continuity yep. over time Which and you doesn't just, exist anymore yeah no it doesn't so um yeah. okay let's and by the see. way coaches universally hate the, the way the transfer portal works universe there's not anybody who thinks now they realize will wade and if will wade likes it well okay <laughs> but the, will wade likes a there's lot a of things a lot of people don't like <laughs> and are kind of weird with um, or maybe he doesn't because now everybody can give strong ass offers and he's not special anymore so maybe true. it goes the other That's way true. but i mean no no coaches like it you know, and, and they all know you can get better quick. You can get the pieces you need, all that. But you're also constantly recruiting your own guys to stay, which takes a lot of effort when you need to be recruiting the next generation to come and yeah. go get the transfers. I mean, it's it's spinning plates and they all hate it. They all absolutely hate it. OK, uh, we'll hit the rest of these quickly. Andy, not our Andy, another Andy. Okay. Uh, well, you're Andy, you're our Andy too, just not bottoms. Uh, as the roster continues to become finalized, I've heard a few people suggest IU may leave one scholarship open. My initial reaction is a bunch of emojis, including the uh, vomit emoji. He says, no, what is the justification for this? Knowing that even in the best circumstances, injuries happen and some players don't develop, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and certainly, you know, last year a lot was said, hey, we've got this open scholarship and they didn't bring in some guard depth. Here's what I would say. I think there are two ways that you use, you know, the 13th scholarship. One is you leave it open to have some flexibility for someone dropping out of the sky that you have a chance on, you know, because that just happens, you know, and so it's nice to have some flexibility. I think the other one is get a high upside developmental guy like, you know, Diamant Blasi from France, who is an incredible athlete, but wouldn't be ready to play. I think you could make an argument in some cases like, hey, use that on a backup guard. But if you look at what Indiana has projected right now, if you've got Rice, Actually, front Carlisle. Issue now. Yeah. yeah, if you've got Rice, Carlisle, Galloway, Cups, like all these guys who have some experience, I don't think the need is guard. Yes, the other one would be, you know, some kind of big man. And that's where I would say lean towards a developmental guy because he's probably not going to play. And so you want to have some upside there. But there is some value to having an open scholarship because it's hard to keep eight guys happy, let alone 12. Yeah. You know, and so that's one of the reasons why coaches do it. And just because of how transient everything is, it's nice to have flexibility. So, yeah, I understand the question, especially coming off of last season. But I think the context is a little bit different for the roster this year based on I'd what say, we're projecting anyway. I'd say a veteran sort of clubhouse guy uh, who can 
come in and do some things in the paint or, or like a wing almost or something, you know, a big wing or something like that, who's obviously not going to be a starter or play a whole lot. If you're going to do it, a one year guy, so it doesn't lock you in to a long term, or Definitely like you said, a one year guy. Yeah. yeah. Or, or somebody that's a long term developmental pro- project who can get in some games early, get their feet wet, and then, you know, sort of maybe get better over time. I think those are the two options. Um, yeah. And, it, but it has to be, I mean, honestly, looking at the roster, it has to be a big wing or a post. I, I just think that you have a lot of yes. guys who can handle the ball and play. If you get Carlisle and, and you know, potentially another shooter, you're small. Yes. You're, you're really small. Uh, your starting lineup is not small, but the rest of your team is. Yes. Bill, on a different topic, what is your opinion on the block charge call? And are there any other rules you think need to be changed or adjusted? Uh, I thought the block charge call was good. I thought the change was good. What was were, the the exact wording of it? I, I saw that. Uh, the, the okay, so basically, if it was going to be a charge, you had to have both feet set before the offensive player moved into his offensive move. Okay. Whereas that didn't that you could slide under. And so before. it basically, it, yeah, it made it a lot harder to draw a charge and to just do the little slide in charges that Mark Titus has always hated. Yeah, um, and, and honestly, the about. change the change I would make with a block charge is who initiates the contact. And if a guy steps in front of you, he's initiating contact. If you have a direct line to the hoop and a guy steps in front of you, he's initiating the contact. But that's not a, even a question. Yeah, you have that's a block for sure now. Yeah, I mean, and and again, so you I, have to be firmly playing. It's what the, yes. it's what I always thought the block kind of should have been. It's like well, you I've have always, to establish this position. I I would say if it was if Ryan Phillips was running basketball, and God forbid. Um, I would say you have to be making a defensive effort. So if you get run over while you're in a stance, but like doing the stand there and cover your junk and wait for someone to hit you, I I don't think that should be rewarded. I really don't. That also works. But a defender, a defender has the right, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but a defender has the right to his, um, you know, to his space, like going backwards, right? So if you're moving back, you have the right to that space already. If you're playing yeah, defense, a hundred percent. And, but I, but I think that just, you know, where you're rewarding guys not playing defense, you know what I mean? And I think yes. you'd eliminate a lot of blocks and charges and the close calls. If guys stopped stepping in and trying to take a, you know, a block, a, a try and take a charge, you'd eliminate the 50, 50 calls. Cause then it's about, well, he slid in to take the charge, but it didn't, you know, and I know that you have the new rule where you have to be established and all of that stuff, but I think if you're not making a basketball play, it's like, to me, it's like the flagrant thing. If it's not a basketball play, it's a flagrant foul. Like if it's not, if you're not making a basketball play, you're the one who's the problem, you know, and, and and the offensive player should have a right to go make an offensive play. And if you're not, if you're just going to stand in his way, like, you know, I don't love that. That'll never be the way it's called, but I think it should be is that because you're rewarding guys, for not playing defense. And how many times does a guy slide in, try and take a charge and a guy Euro steps right around him and lays it in. You're teaching bad habits. I mean, you really are. And yeah, I don't know. The other rule I would change. I've talked about this before. You go back to first principles. Basketball is an entertainment product. We want the best players on the floor more. It's better when the best players are deciding the game. And there are, we know with college basketball, officiating is inconsistent from game to game. I would add a sixth foul. I agree. I would make it a, technical foul so if it happens the other team gets a free throw so there is a penalty for keeping that guy out there but you keep more players out there and it just helped you know it's like you remember the, the i wouldn't even make it a technical game. i wouldn't even make maybe it maybe not technical. yeah you don't necessarily have to do that but i would add a sixth foul so that you know like trace jackson davis just picked up two just random fouls early in that game wasn't a guy that got a lot of fouls and now he's sitting for the whole first half i would you can say would, well he shouldn't foul but what if what if the foul in that game is different than a foul in a in an earlier game and we see that all the time so i it would, would just also, help smooth out the impact that officials have on the game and make sure we keep the best players on the court i don't want to go to a quarter system i know that works in women's basketball i don't want that for men um oh gosh i would i wouldn't no i don't want that but i will say I will say unless there's until five minutes left, a foul in the backcourt should not get free throws. Even if you're over the limit, it, you know, cause the offensive foul does not give you free throws. I would say if it's in the backcourt until five minutes left, cause obviously that's when automatic fouling start, you know, uh, intentional fouling starts till five minutes foul in the backcourt does not give you a one on one or a, or a two, two shot foul. Cause there's a lot what of, cause we, I, hmm? what, what, why? What's the because I think that it's first of all when it gets just into this endless free throw shooting thing, but it also I think it 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 
has it when you're over the limit, I think guys can not hustle as hard for rebounds and things like that because they're worried about impacting a player or they won't reach in and try and grab a, you know, a 50 50 ball or whatever, or a jump ball or something like that, or try for a steal on a press or whatever because they're worried about okay, a foul that then will re- result in free throws when you don't have that limit there. Now, now it should count against the player. But I just don't think it should count as it, you should have free throws. Now, once you cross half court, you're in an offensive set. You're you're okay. making an offensive play. Therefore, if you get fouled, you should get your free throws because you're disrupting the offense. In the backcourt, I don't think you should do that until, again, like five minutes left, under five. If there's a foul, you go to the line because teams would take advantage of that and foul to stop your progress and things like that. So, um, But while the game's still in the run of play, I, I wouldn't give free throws for that. Okay. Um, let's see, Tony, what are the expectations for Ja'Kai Newton this season? His name seems to be left out of the conversations. Can he shoot at all? I don't think anybody knows. Everybody remains very intrigued by Ja'Kai's potential. He has not played a whole lot of competitive basketball the last two years, just due to some of the injuries. He is a guy, the, the guy that he always reminded me of after watching his film. And then when FAU went on the run is Elijah Martin. You know, just a really good athlete, can defend, can shoot a little, can handle a little, like not great at anything besides athleticism, but just good at a bunch of stuff and a ton of potential. Like he's got NBA potential if some of the skills come around. I think he's a decent shooter, not great, but the form is good enough that you can, you know, kind of see it. So here, all I'll say is how I'm operating, and this is obviously never being at practice and never seeing him play. I'm essentially not expecting anything from him. And that's why I don't put his name in these conversations. I'm expecting something from him long term because I think he's got a lot of potential. But for this year, I'm thinking anything is a bonus. Like if you told me right now, hey, Ja'Kai Newton is the sixth man by the end of the year and really added this new dimension to Indiana. Wow. It wouldn't shock me because he's got that kind of potential. I'm just not going to expect that from a kid who's hasn't played in two years. And this would be his first time playing college basketball competitively. So yeah. I would love the potential long-term not expecting anything this season and would be pleasantly surprised if he does. Um, I would say, yeah, low expectations because it's going to be his first season um, after health issues. And so I think he looks like a developmental prospect right now. And I think that's how people should treat him. You know, just if he's healthy this year, don't raise your expectations for what you're going to get. I think there's potential for him to be a really good player, but he's also, again, missed a long time after an injury, you know, and and so it's going to take him time to feel comfortable back on a basketball court in a game setting. And so I would just, I would tamp down the expectations for that. All right. Alex and Jeff's questions, I think we basically answered. So let's end it with David's. So he says, I agree with the common opinion that adding a backcourt or frontcourt player with demonstrated shooting proficiency is a priority, but I wonder if we are overlooking the potential for Anthony and Gabe to be part of the solution to our shooting. And, you know, to be fair, Gabe ended up shooting, I think, like 35% from three last year on very low volume. Um, Much better towards the end of the year. Better towards the end of the year, better on catch and shoot, you know, was not as good off the dribble. Leo obviously had some big shots. He was in the high 30s, I think, too, again, on low volume. So where do those, when you're talking about, we need shooting, are you thinking that it could come from those guys or are you just assuming that they're farther down the rotation and you got to have someone who's, I, I, I think this is a fair question actually. It is because you know, um, I think you, you need more. Where do you stand I'll, on those guys? I'll say it straight up. I think you need more. Um, uh, again, Gabe was not a knockdown shooter. He made shots in high school, but he was not set up as a knockdown shooter. He was a playmaker more than anything. Uh, he scored a lot of points, but really you could see his default is making plays, whether it's for him or for somebody else. He wasn't a shooter. Anthony came in as a shooter, and and uh, I think his size works against him in that way because he's going to face a lot of bigger defenders in the Big Ten. We have four years of evidence. I know he didn't play that whole time. We have four years of evidence that he's not going to be a volume three-point shooter for you, and I don't think he will be next year. I think he'll have a similar role. I think he should play more, way more than he did this year. I think he earned it. I was disappointed that he never got a chance to start this year after his run of really good games. Um, I was very vocal about that, but I just don't see him being a guy who's going to take four a game, you know, and, and, and consistently. Um, as he was for nine Gabe, for 19 last year, playing 23% of overall minutes. For yeah. I, I just, I think that's he, very low volume. Obviously. Now I think he could shoot more, but I also think there were times last year where he couldn't get a shot off because the guy defending him was bigger than him. 
you know, I mean, he does and, have and a bit of a deliberate release on the shot. I mean, he, he needs does have space. a deliberate release and he's just not, he's not six, five and long, you know, I mean, that's, it's, it, there's nothing, it's just physical limitations, not his fault. Um, he is six but, five, but he doesn't have, or I mean, I, like, you know what I mean? Like six, six athletic yeah. jump out of the gym kind of guy that you're going to get on the wing in the big 10. Um, I, but yeah, I'll say that I think that those guys could improve their numbers. Certainly. I don't, I don't think we're betting against that, but I don't think it's enough. I think you need to go get guys who have done it before at maybe not at high, high, high volume, but at some level of volume who've hit shots in college, who have the confidence that they can hit shots in college and who can step in and are willing to come off the bench and not get into the flow of the game before they take one, but step off the bench ready to shoot. And that's something Indiana hasn't had in a while is somebody who could just walk on the floor and be like, I'm ready to shoot. And I think Miller cop to some degree, but remember he felt his way through his first year, I think. And then he kind of got going his software, his, his, uh, sorry, second year at Indiana. Um, they haven't had a guy who was just like, I'm going to shoot the lights out since Zeisloft really, who could come off the bench and be like, give me the ball. I'm going to shoot it, you know? And they had other guys who could dribble into shots. It could play, you know, but I'm talking a straight shooter. That's what he does. Um, I don't think they've had one in a long time and they need that because every team right. needs that quite frankly. Yeah. Look, I think what Gabe and Anthony showed is if you need them to play in a pinch, I think you can have some trust that they're going to go out there. And, like I think Gabe was below re replacement level last year. I think he could be a replacement level player this year with the, I could even, I think he could even be a little above that modified by his role. Because he was not a starter last year, and I think that hurt. Yeah, him. so I think like if the idea is, hey, we just want to make the NCAA tournament, you know, those guys playing minutes and kind of being your shooters, I can see it. If the idea is we want to raise the ceiling to be a second weekend team that has Final Four potential, I think you need better, more dynamic players in your eighth, ninth roles. Full well knowing you've got some insurance with those guys there for and injury. maybe in certain like matchups, they're valuable. Those guys play, yeah, yes. It's not to say they aren't valuable, but. I think if we're looking if with higher end goals, you know, you want, you know, maybe someone who can do some more things. Last thing, Russell asked this, this question. He said, do we want Woody to run Bob Knight's offense? Because according to Brian Evans and Todd Leary, Knight never set screens for all for Calbert. Their job was to get their own shots. That's not true. That has to be a misunderstanding. I think what Brian Evans and Todd Leary said is they didn't run plays for Calbert and Alford. They well, ran motion. Yes. Everyone was constantly setting screens in that offense. So the screens were being set. They just weren't like, you know, running number one, which is to get Calvert a shot. Like yes. every offensive possession was to get Calvert a shot. I like ran that motion. Was just, I, yes, I ran a version it, of Bob Knight's offense in high school. And yeah, it's, I, it's I more, have to think that was just a misunderstanding of what they said. And what you have to understand about a motion offense, it's not a sequence of plays. It's a set of principles and you trust yeah. the players to run the principles and understand each other. And you practice it so much that, you know, like one of the principles is if you drive at a guy, he cuts back door every time. And you know, you trust the guy with the ball to read the floor and know that's open. So when he drives at you, you know, like, why aren't you passing me the ball? You know, instantly go back door. Cause it's open. Even if you don't see it and look for the ball, um, you know, it's uh, you pass and you cut away and you either cut over the top to get open or you cut away and set a screen and then you roll back and you're open on the wing now too. And so it's just a set of principles. Now you can run plays within it, but the plays are usually just doing things in a sequence that are just the set of principles. It's, it's and it's usually yes. because it's motion, you have five options for every play and literally yeah. every player on the floor is an option in a motion play. And so yeah, I would agree. I, I think that that's a misunderstanding of what they were talking about because the idea that they never ran sets that would it's that pass and the, screen away, where, pass and screen away. Yeah. That's the offense where where the top option of that set that you're running would not be Alford or Calvert. I mean, that's that's ludicrous. Um, and the other yeah. thing is where you put them on the floor to initiate the offense. A lot of times in motion winds up leading to them getting the ball in a position to score after you do the you know, the, the set of things that you're going to do, but yeah, pass and screen away is the basic motion principle, um, or pass and do a face cut or pass and cut to the corner. Like there's, yeah, it's all very basic, but yeah, and it's hard to run if you've never run it before, because it's, yes. you know, you, it's, it's a, it's a read and react thing and you're reacting to what the defense is giving you. 
and you have to be on the same page as all the other guys. But the fact that you have to be on the same page as all the other guys and you don't know what you're doing, it's like jazz music. Yes. Nobody else knows what you're going to do either. Great analogy. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's that, just that's what made of, it so hard to defend. Because you know, and no, he said he, he was following up on what Leary and Evan said. He said if they didn't get open, they would sit the bench. Calvert and Steve didn't sit the bench a lot. But I think what he means is it was their responsibility to read the defense and make the right decisions to get themselves open, knowing that basically everybody else on the court, their number one objective was th this is our top score. Keep reversing the night the ball. was very clear. Like basketball is not a democracy. There are guys who are supposed to get shots and, you know, maybe secondary guys. I mean, Brian guys Sloan, to set his whole career up. was setting screens for guys. So I have yeah, to think I, that was a bit of a misunderstanding. Yeah. And one last thing about that is to saying like, if they didn't get shots, they'd sit the bench. Usually in motion, the way you get open is by cutting hard and making the right decision. So yeah, if they're not cutting hard and they're not making the right decision, they probably yeah. were going to sit on the bench, you know, and, yeah. and it, it probably didn't have to do anything with them like figuring it out one-on-one. -on -one. Motion is not a one-on-one -on -one offense. Now there are times where you get the ball somewhere on the floor, your defender is still recovering and you can take him one-on-one -on -one because you have the room to take him one-on-one. -on -one. But it's not set up to isolate you one on one with somebody. It's a, it's supposed to set you up in a position where maybe you're coming off a cut, and your guy's behind you. Boom! Now you can go on him. Or the option would be if you catch it and you're ready to go, and he recovers, somebody else is going to be open. And so it's yeah. yeah, it's a very much a flowing offense with a lot of movement and a lot of hustle. And it's kind of what I wish Mike Woodson would run because he was a Bob Knight protege. Now I don't think motion would work in the NBA because I don't pl think players are going to move that much. I don't think they're going to hustle that much for 48 minutes. It's, well, it's also, tough to do that. Yeah, and ISO makes more sense in the NBA because the guys are so good. So talented. You know? I mean, yeah. so it's just, it's a different ball game. Completely. In, in college, it can. And in college, defenses just aren't, number That's one, you have a longer game. shot clock to wear guys out. And so if you just keep doing that, defenses are going to lack discipline and you're going to find an opening. NBA, the shot clock is so much shorter, you don't have as much time to do that. Um, anyway, I mean, that's, that's a fun conversation to have, but maybe we'll have another, another one like that in the off season. Um, Ryan, any but, final thoughts? Yeah. And, and just somebody put in the, in the chat, like no screens to get a shot. The motion offense has plenty of screens in it. It wouldn't, it might not be a direct screen, like a, a on ball screen to you. Yeah, yeah. Like they weren't running a double stagger to get no. McKenzie and Baco around for, but a there shot. are, there are dozens of screens in every time you run a set or at least a yeah. dozen every time you run a set and, and, and moving off. And yeah. So, I mean, you can go, go watch an old Indiana game. They're screening all the time. Yeah. Okay. So he said, maybe you are correct. And Todd and Brian say things in the moment that are not accurate. I am not questioning Brian Evans and Todd Leary's understanding of the offense. It's the interpretation obviously. of yeah, what they well, said. Yeah. Actually, Russell, can you send me where they said that? Because I'd, I'd be curious to hear it. I have to think it was a misunderstanding or something because that there were definitely screens. Or what they're saying doesn't translate to what they mean, sort of. Yeah. Because I like you can watch the championship game. I've watched the 87 championship game. Alfred gets screens when he's running around the, you know, to, to get open. I mean, it's, it's very obvious. Now, maybe it's they're not setting a specific screen for them, it's just part of the right. offense. Like that, that's what yeah, I think. Cause I've heard, I've meant. heard Brian Evans say that before. And that's, so that's what I think. That's like what they I were equal meant. as far as who gets what screen and all of that stuff. It just happened to be when Alfred came off it, give him the damn ball, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> Usually a good option. Usually yeah. a good option. Your favorite former Hoosier. Yes. Steve Alfred. I loved him as a player. <laughs> he was awesome, man. He was so great. Yep. Um, all right. That is going to do it for us on this week's edition of the Assembly Call. Look at us breaking the two-hour mark. Whew, okay, we're getting into this off. Starting a late bit. and breaking the two-hour mark. <laughs> I know. If you want to see us do the show live, join us at assemblycall.com on Thursday nights for the live broadcast of our Assembly Call radio recording. Thank you to Bob Thompson for producing our music. Thank you to John Ringer of Rig Design for designing our logos and submitting a question. And thank you for listening. We'll be back. Well, certainly next Thursday, but maybe before if, you know, some interesting news happens. Uh, until then. Take it from me, Rob Pennessy. Keep your eyes on the rim and your elbows in. Go Hoosiers. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. I think they've gotten enough show. Fair. By the way, I am absolutely going and pulling you when you were doing your Greg Doyle rant. And you said, will you just shut up and ask your question? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely it. pulling that. So do anytime it. there's do a it. pause. You can pull that can whole clip that and replay quick. it if you want, because I meant every <laughs> word of it. God. Oh, man. wait. Okay, do we need AC After Dark? Someone just said, Ryan, do not like Alford as a coach.
because this could be another hour long episode. We've done two hours. We should stop. Really we should stop. It's late. It's yeah. Late. <laughs> no, I do not think Steve Alford is a great We have player. a lot of respect for Steve Alford as a player. As a player. Absolutely. No question. One of the great college basketball players of all time. And he, yep. to be fair, he's been a good college basketball coach. Yeah. I don't think he's at Indiana's level. Okay. Fair. That's all I'll Look say. At that. Wow. You there's, did it there's, in 10 seconds. There's more there, but no, I do not think he's worthy of the Indiana job. Okay. That's where we'll end it. Like we should, I feel like we should end it with something better than that. <laughs> so. Go Hoosiers. There you go. go. Bye, everybody. Here I come. This is done, Sony. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right, everybody. Talk to you soon.